Um, hi everyone. So this is Helen Fernandez, and I'm going to be um, uh, conducting a class today with respect to you know practical know-hows on family law. Uh, to start off, I think I should introduce myself and give uh, something about some background about myself, so you need to know. Uh, where, uh, what do I, uh, where do I come from? What do I do, et cetera, et cetera. I am running a family law practice all by myself. Uh, it's a, um, and I've been working with another firm for some years prior to signing on. Um, yeah, uh, so, to start off with, yes, I've been working um, with someone else, another firm, where I was taking care of the entire family law practice by myself. And then I um, decided to start this on my own. So I've started uh, working on my own. And it is uh, a very, very, very good process to um, start your own family law practice. It is an amazing journey and I um, encourage every single one of you who are interested in proceeding with family law uh, to uh, you know, take the uh, self-practice route because working in another firm may or may not be suitable for every single individual depending on uh, how much you're willing to take. So um, in this, particular course, I will to some extent also touch base with how you can start your own practice, you know, uh, start from scratch or start with as less resources as possible. So you can be uh, self-sustaining and at the same time bring in some income so you'll be able to uh, manage your practice with the family law, um, you know, along with any other practice that you want to practice. Family law in general is uh, quite cumbersome. It does uh, take up a lot of a lot from you. It is also one of the most uh, difficult laws to practice because you're not just showing or you know teaching the law, but you're also uh, kind of emotionally involved with your clients to a great extent. And sometimes you can get emotionally swayed along with your client, trying to you know get them uh, their results that they are expecting from you. So that's why it's very important for you to remain grounded at all times whenever uh, you know, you're practicing family law. Um, so um, to start off with, I prepared uh, a very um, small, very simple PowerPoint presentation. And I'm gonna share that screen with you all so we can go on from there on to see how we can go about with the introduction of today's family law um, uh, in practice as a family lawyer. And I will be going over several things that you need to, uh, that you may need to know when you are commencing or starting off your family law practice. So uh, let me share the screen with you and then we can go about with our uh, today's uh, session. Just bear with me for a second. Meanwhile, while the uh, PowerPoint um, is uh, coming up. I can continue to tell you exactly what you're what you're going to be um, learning in this particular session that I'm going to be holding on. Uh, this is not going to be, you know, uh, talking about family law, you know, educating about the case laws or anything of that sort. But we can definitely touch base with the case laws and things like that depending on the uh, type of uh, different fields that we are going to be discussing. But mostly this is about how to practically practice your family law. And I will be going over in details with the kind of forms, with samples that I can provide you in due course of time, and the kind of um, you know how to start off with your initial meeting with a client, what is the client's expectations and what you need to uh, you know, prepare yourself in a meeting, what you need to advise your clients, uh, what are the different processes within the family law, which is, for example, separation agreement, um, you know, any other agreements such as domestic contracts, how to take a matter to court, etc. All these things would be the one that I'm going to be assisting you uh, as much as I can. And uh, please do also, I do prefer if I get get feedbacks from uh, people. So if you specifically need me to touch base with 
any um, particular topic, I can definitely uh, go on to it. Uh, while I'm preparing for the next lectures, I will give you a heads up as to what I'm gonna be talking about. And if you have any specific questions, you can. I will provide you with my email address by the end of the day. So then you can actually send me the question so I can prepare myself accordingly and also um, give you a better um, insight on those particular questions of yours during our next lecture, okay? So um, to start off with, uh, we're gonna be start talking about initial meetings and consultations with clients. So whenever you're um, practicing as, a, you know, when you're practicing as a family lawyer, you know, the first encounter is with the clients either over the phone where they would wanna have some information about what their rights are. Uh, always use the disclaimer, which, you know, which is, you know, everybody needs to know that, you know, whatever consult or whatever advice you're giving, it's consultational, right? And they are not being retained at that particular point. But there are many misunderstandings that, as, especially in family law, uh, people have when they give you a call, the clients have an expectation that you're going to take care of certain things. So, you know, from the beginning, you need to build that, you need to make sure that you're not building any expectations from the clients um, at any point. They should know that what you, what the, um, you know, the basic gist of the meeting is about is to discuss all the issues and maybe give them some guidance and tell them how they need to proceed with it. So then the parties can have, uh, you know, a better idea of how to proceed with their case and also to decide whether they wanna retain you or not. So in initial meetings and consultations, forms. I mean, everybody would have their own set, particular set of forms that uh, they would wanna have in an initial meeting and consultations. But uh, you need to have a separate, a very different form for family law in general. Uh, whether it is your private client or whether uh, you're, you're gonna be a legal aid or family lawyer, you need to separate your uh, retainer agreements. So probably you may have about three different types of retainers. One could be um, a private retainer. The other one could be um, the legal aid retainer. And the third one could be, uh, you know, specifically only limited retainer where you're only being retained to probably draft a separation agreement and that's it and not to go beyond it, not to communicate anything. You're just helping or assisting the party or the client to attend your office, draft that separation agreement, and then they will go on dealing with it on their own. So even in these situations, you need to make sure at every point that the client is very clearly aware as to where your uh, engagement with that client you know, starts and where it stops. Because the many reasons why you receive a law society complaint is because you have failed to identify your particular role in this um, in this particular matter. So clients actually have sometimes unrealistic approaches or unrealistic expectations from you. And that is the reason why you need to properly identify them in your retainer agreements. So in our uh, future meetings, when they have the next session, I will uh, probably uh, provide you with uh, you know, samples of um, a private, a legal aid, and even, uh, you know, the other type of retainer, which is a limited retainer, okay? Forms, initial forms. I personally practice with something called a consultation form. So the client is very, it's, it's not really necessary to have a consultation form, but the fact is that if you are having an initial meeting and if you have a consultation form, it kind of triggers it in the client's mind that this is just a consultation and you're not being retained at that point because it's very important for the client to understand that this is not, uh, you know, uh, you're not being retained because if they can walk away thinking that they can take your advice out and, you know, uh, hold you against it. So it is very important that you can say that it's a consultation at the end of the meeting. If your client chooses not to consult, uh, I mean, not to proceed with you or even wants to think about it, maybe you may want to wait for a day or two. And after that, you may immediately want to give or send them a non-engagement letter. A non-engagement letter is also another sample that I can definitely um, assist you with, uh, you know, giving it to you. So that could be something that you can use as, as a precedent if you ever want to use in the future. Uh, what is expected of you in, in terms of due diligence, I've already explained to you 
that you know the way you are going to be conducting your meeting is extremely important because you don't want to create unrealistic approaches because family law entails a very very vast amount of information you cannot complete any of that in a in a one hour meeting with a client one even if it's a half hour or 40 minutes or whatever your practice is going to be uh, stating that the meeting is supposed to be for Okay, uh, secondly, I'm sure uh, as barristers, you're already aware, the ones who are practicing and the ones who are new uh, uh, lawyers, uh, just to let you know the identifications are extremely important when you're meeting a client. You do need to uh, you know, uh, take in two pieces of identifications. Uh, they should be all government uh, IDs. Health card is not an ID. Make sure as lawyers, you do not take health card as IDs from clients. Um, they are not identifications because they are actually insurance cards. And uh, OHIP, the Ontario um, Health System, do not, uh, the ministry does not uh, want the health cards to be used and as an identification because it's basically an insurance number. You're not supposed to expose your own insurance numbers to anybody else. It is your own health insurance and it should be your own private health insurance and not to be shared with anybody else. Uh, however, SIM cards used to be identity, uh, uh, identities in the past, uh, but you uh, do not get SIM cards anymore from the government, so that cannot be used an ID, as an ID. So make sure you're doing your identifications very well. I will be providing a copy of the identification form as well, because in that you do need to put in you know, basic information such as you know, the party's name, uh, the, uh, the party's um, date of birth, the, the current address, phone number, employment information. Trust me, when you get audited, if you do not put your client's employment information, whether it's unemployed, you need to write that down, that it's unemployed or employed. If you do not, you do get audited very badly and you do get marked down for those. So it is very important because when you start your own practice as a family lawyer, you will get audited within the first four years. And then you will get uh, another audit within the first seven years, which is a complete uh, practice review. Um, so I believe you uh, may or may not be aware of these things. And which is, again, as I said, when I am going to be uh, discussing the initial meetings and consultations in detail, I will be providing you know, some information with respect to how to prepare your office in such a way that you are ready for any sort of um, you know spot audits um, by the law society and also um, preparing yourself for uh, practice review and management uh, so <clears throat> inquiries i've uh, mentioned in paragraph three uh, in my uh, presentation slide about inquiries inquiries are something that you need to do so it is not just client is sitting there um, asking you for advice but it is also you who needs to start questioning the client on various levels. Clients are very, very um, wary of the fact that they need to, they uh, wanna, or needs to share their financial information. Sometimes you do need to tap in to get the idea of whether the client is actually being truthful or honest to you, because if your client is not honest to you, you may have a totally different information and idea of what the you know the actual case is about, and then you may uh, further down the road maybe you know faced with a surprise which you do not want to you know be faced with, which could be quite embarrassing, or, or it may put you or your practice in jeopardy by any chance. So it is very very important for you to make the necessary inquiries during this initial consultation. So it is not just about getting the client's story because the client sitting on the other side is coming with a lot of baggage. They're coming with their, uh, their part of the story where they want to, they, they just want somebody to hear them out because they have gone through something that they were not expecting in their marriage or whether it's a common law um, partnership or whatever uh, their um, situation may be. They are coming here with a baggage and they're not expecting you, you know, to, you know, be not be mindful. They want somebody to hear them out. So hear them out. But at the same time, while you're hearing them out, don't allow them to get swayed in their story. Uh, shorten their um, talks so you can do the necessary in inquiries during the whole um, period in due course. So it is extremely important to do inquiries. And I will, again, 
uh, touch base with uh, these kind of inquiries as well as to what kind of inquiries you may want to need to do. do. Uh, inquiries such as about the finances, as I said. So finances could be about, you know, what kind of bank accounts do you have? Do you keep cash in your pocket? Do you um, have any uh, properties here overseas? Were these properties given to you, uh, gifted to you during marriage, before marriage? How much money did you bring in into the marriage? So that you can actually, you know, when you are assisting the, uh, the client with the pre preparing the net family property, you have a better idea as to how to put the net family property together. Because there are several things that you may want to look when you look into the net family property statement, which is a, um, a detailed form, you will then know exactly how to fill that form. It is quite complicating and there are times when lawyers tend to make quite a lot of mistakes, uh, you know, while preparing the net family property or the financial statement of the client. So it is very important for you to do the necessary inquiries to ask your client the necessary questions. So they can, you know, uh, they are, you know, sent back with the homework to provide to you, you know. Another thing that family lawyers must practice is during inquiries, if they decide to be retained, if the um, client decides to retain you, what you need to do is you do need to tell your client to write their story down in their own words to you. You uh, taking notes down could, uh, could be fine, but it could be, you know, there could be a misunderstanding or there could be a point or a time where you may misunderstand the facts of the case. Even at times, even today, whenever I'm, whenever I'm writing down whatever my client has told me, there are times when I'm misunderstanding the facts because the clients have a different, uh, you know, take on it. And you want to make sure that you're taking the facts down um, properly because these are the same facts that you may be utilizing in the future in a motion or in an affidavit on behalf of your client. And then in the future, your client should not blindly sign the affidavit and later on blame you for it saying that, look, I did not tell you this. Why did you write it this way? This was not the fact. Or if it is something that can be damage control, fair enough, you can do the damage control. But the biggest thing that you need to do is get your client to send you everything in writing. It is very, very important in family courts because it is not your story, it is their story. So you need to know their story from their, from them straight up. Uh, I believe I have basically given you uh, quite a lot uh, information in terms of the initial meeting itself, initial meeting and consultation. So in that initial meeting, once you get the idea of what the, you know, uh, what the client's, uh, you know, issues are, then you may be able to give them the proper advice in terms of, okay, uh, maybe a separation agreement is the better route for you in this case, or maybe, you know, um, a collaborative uh, negotiation could be something better for you. So that is what's something that I'm going to be touching base in the next um, slide, and I'm going to just click that next slide for you. So this is the separation process. So there are three ways to proceed with a separation process. So when do you do a separation process is something that you need to know prior to me uh, taking you down to these three ways to proceed with separation. So uh, there are times when parties do not have much uh, to negotiate among each other. Maybe and this is just like a very short-lived marriage, a year, a year or two. And then it is, they do not have much in terms of you know, assets to be shared with, or they don't have any children. Uh, a separation agreement would be a fastest route for them Do the separation agreement so that they can proceed with the divorce. As a family lawyer, you need to understand that the reason why, you know, you're encouraged to encourage your client to do the separation agreement is so that they cannot get sued in the future by their client, by their um, part, uh, the opposing party by any chance. So um, if suppose a party separated a year before and then they came to your office today, they came to your office today because the party has done their, the client has done their own homework. They know that, you know, you can get a separate, uh, you can get a divorce a year later. What are you going to do? You're going to inquire. You're going to do the inquiry first. You're going to ask them questions such as, uh, what do I do here? Do I take the, uh, do I take the divorce application and just file a, a simple divorce? Or do I do the necessary inquiry as to whether he or she has done their needful to protect their properties or, or to protect 
whatever the issues are, you know, to protect their rights first, and then uh, they should be proceeding with divorce. So this is the reason why when the client uh, comes into your office, they want to spend as less money as possible in family court. But the unfortunate uh, thing is family law, family courts are expensive and family courts are doing some amount of, um, you know, assistance uh, to help clients to reduce their spending by forcing them not to bring in a lot of motions, right? But at the end of the day, you know, these parties that come in, sometimes they say like, oh, we try to negotiate something among each other. We just had one house together. We sold our house. We separated our money. We do not have anything else. Can you just go ahead and um, just do the divorce for me? Yet again, if you want to proceed with the divorce, you must do your due diligence. What I would suggest to you is to take that in writing from the client that you've advised your client that a separation agreement is still something that is necessary to put it in paper that you know the um, you know all the assets have been divided. There was only something which the, your client is stating is that there was only a house that was there and the parties have divided their share of the houses and there is nothing else remaining. Because clients do not know that there is an extreme need of exchanging financial disclosure among each other. There are many things that spouses do not share with each other during marriage. There are some spouses prefer to have joint uh, everything but there are some marriages where spouses do not prefer to have everything joined. So there are points or times when uh, you need to know the uh, need to do the due diligence, where you need to tell your client, "Look, you do you know that you need to do a financial exchange?" I'm hoping that um, everybody can see me and also can see the um, presentation screen. Now, I'm sorry for the minor interruption. Uh, maybe we can uh, start off again. So I was at uh, the separation process. So I said uh, the, uh, you know, every party, uh, there could be uh, the most easiest way uh, for any client to approach is for uh, the client to come to you asking, I want a divorce. This is the most easiest and the most basic thing that a client comes in uh, to your door asking for because they do not know the entire process of family law, how it works. So that is where you need to step in. You need to go and tell them that divorce is actually the last process in, a, in, in um, you know, ending a matrimonial uh, relationship. Actually, they have commenced with separation. Sometimes they're not even separated. They're actually living together and they're just coming in to do inquiries on uh, how they should proceed with separations. So the, that's when you can decide as to what is the proper process or what is the proper avenue for you to take with that particular client's request. So um, let's go through the uh, different types of um, processes that lawyers uh, try to take to proceed with the client's request to separate from their spouses or finally to obtain the divorce. So the first one is actually um, quite a uh, a conventional route, which is the uh, collaborative lawyer's route, which is what actually uh, many lawyers are trying to, you know, start um, utilizing this particular approach in family courts, because this is less contested, less highly con uh, co conflicted, and uh, parties are able to parties are able to proceed, uh, you know, with less um, vindictiveness with each other, they're able to proceed. Just bear with me, I think there's something wrong again. Just a minute. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know, a lot of people are trying to get in. Yeah, it seems like it, that's what I'm seeing. Uh, because there was a new link prepared, uh, done, I guess. I don't know if they received, everybody's received a new link. So let me just take a look. Thank you for letting me know. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and continue. Uh, so what I was talking about is collaborative lawyers. So what collaborative lawyers are really doing is to assist parties to you know, proceed with this whole separation with as less animosity with each other. 
So actually, collaborative lawyers are lawyers who are actually sitting across the table, you know, a conference room with their clients across each other and trying to negotiate things point by point. And this actually helps them, firstly, to avoid, um, you know, a lot of uh, legal costs because clients can save up a lot in terms of legal costs. And collaborative lawyers do not have the approach of uh, blaming each other, you know. So they do they uh, encourage the client not to point fingers at the other, but simply to deal with the situation. I see that there's something wrong again. Is everybody in or is everybody able to get in? It seems like a lot of people can't. Yeah, I don't know. I think there's a control in it. So. I'm not sure if they don't have the right login code or what the problem is. That's why I ended. Yeah. I think people are having problems with the Zoom app. Seems like it. we're having a lot of interruptions today. Hopefully we don't do this. We don't have this again. I think some people are not logged in with Zoom and apparently they're saying that they need an email and password for Zoom. I'm just reading what's what is being texted. Yeah, that's, uh, I believe you do need to download the Zoom app. Well, uh, it's interesting because I just joined it through Skype, but I think there's more than one way to join, but. Uh, yeah, it could be. If there's probably some people are joining in through phone or is it, are you, have you joined through phone? Uh, well, I'm actually on both, believe it or not. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you on my laptop, but I'm actually looking at the typing on the phone. And apparently the people are having problems because they haven't given their email to Zoom. So apparently Zoom is asking for their email before they can do anything. So they're all tied up with that, apparently. Okay. I think they're working. I guess can, yeah. I guess we can start continue probably. Yeah, just continue. Don't worry. Yes, I'm just going to continue now, okay? So we can, because uh, I have a lot to cover. So I'm hoping I can cover it now. <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, um, please, uh, all students, uh, talk with her for confirmation. Are yes, you all please. in? Uh, I'm apparently not, because I'm looking, I'm looking at the, uh, Skype group on my phone. I can see and a lot of people are and a lot of people are still trying to get on. I can see about 18 participants so far. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, ma'am, I suppose the problem is that uh, once uh, since it's a business account, NC Exam Guru has got business account. Whenever you are to log in, you should have logged in into Zoom with your email ID and password after yeah. registering. Hey. Only then you can join. You're talking about some people. Can you join or the other people? Yeah. I don't know. Some people can't get on. Yeah. Oh, apparently. All right. Okay, all right, so uh, I was talking about collaborative lawyers. So that's the approach of collaborative lawyers. What collaborative lawyers really do is basically assist the parties to negotiate down you know, their terms, 
to, uh, you know, to whatever they need to negotiate. So it could be just, you know, the party's uh, matrimonial home, their finances, uh, child custody, you know, um, child related uh, issues, how to do the parenting count, <clears throat> excuse me, and all these things. And collaborative lawyers are very well versed in uh, assisting parties to, uh, you know, assist them in getting this done, done uh, in a very short period of time with, with less amount of um, stress. But that would depend on both parties, whether they're able to sit across each other and they're able to negotiate it. In most cases where, you know, in every relationship when it's soured, neither party is willing to sit across the table to negotiate or even see each other's face. That's what we're gonna face in family law. So uh, then we have the next approach, which is through uh, lawyers' negotiations and meetings and ex uh, mediations, et cetera. So have, that is, a, yes. Um, if you don't mind, can I ask you a question on CFL? Yes, yes. So, yes. Um, so on, on CFL, if, if we try to remember, we have studied in theory that, you know, yeah. if it fails by any chance, then the lawyers, the same lawyers cannot go into litigation. That's correct. That correct? Yes. That's correct. So yes. in that case, say, for example, we are sitting in a CFL meeting yeah. and it collapses for some yes. reason. It doesn't yes. go ahead with anything. Yes. The parties mm -hmm. want to proceed to the court at some point. That's then right. At that point, do we suggest the clients to go and look for another lawyer for themselves to represent them? Yes, we do. So okay. obviously, uh, you know, what, oh, what the whole point of entering the collaborative um, uh, family lawyers initially, when they start off the process itself, they are telling the parties that you're coming in with a mindset to settle, right? right. You're not going to go out without settling. That's the mindset that you need to have when you're entering a collaborative, uh, you know, settlement. So if you do not have that mindset from the beginning, it's not worth it to even, uh, you know, embark onto it. So that's why when a collaborative lawyer is actually taking that process on, they are going to ensure that the clients, you know, end goal is to settle this, and they do not have much in terms of, you know, um, you know, a lot of animosity or any other things, or they're not carrying a baggage with them when they're coming into the table. Because if you come with a baggage, you're not able to settle it. And, you know, uh, in that case, it's never going to be successful and it is going to fail, right? And there, uh, but uh, in that case, obviously the collaborative lawyers are not allowed to proceed with, you know, uh, outside negotiations. Because in collaborative, uh, in these uh, meetings, what we're doing is when we're sitting across each other and trying to negotiate things down back and forth, it's all on a without prejudice basis. And there could be many things that, you know, the lawyers could use against each other. And uh, they know much more than what they should have known because, you know, all the information was shared uh, on the first hand, which it could have been just the, um, the client's privilege to, to, to tell his or her lawyer alone. But in a collaborative meeting, that's not possible, you know, because we're trying to settle this. And that's the reason why collaborative lawyers are not allowed to proceed with, uh, you know, a further negotiations or if the negotiations do not, you know, end up into, you know, a fair separation agreement or, you know, end up, uh, you know, a, a process where, you know, they're ended everything. So that's when, uh, that's the reason why collaborative lawyers do need to advise their clients well in advance if this fails, I cannot proceed with being a lawyer. You would be needed to um, uh, retain another counsel of your own if, if need be, you know, but uh, at the end of the day, there is very less chances during, you know, such process for it not to succeed because that's the attitude that people uh, try to go in with. Parties are very much aware, you know, and these are parties who have actually been able to negotiate most of the issues within among themselves anyway. And these are parties who are actually in good terms. They're able to settle things among each other. They're able to you know, communicate with each other on a better scale, on a better level. These are not the kind of um, uh, you know, parties who are actually going to be taking this matter to court. Unless there was um, you know, a lot of information that was hidden from the other party, right? And that's when the other party can sue uh, the other, even after a separation agreement was prepared because they were not, you know, some information was not brought in, into the table during negotiations. Um, uh, I don't know, Abba, did I answer your question? Yes, Helena, I'm, I'm okay. good now. Thank okay. you. Yeah, I was 
I was going to ask you one question because you were yes. saying that the lawyers, of course, can't be the same ones, let's say, if they were going to litigate. Yes. But if the information is revealed to the clients, the clients, if they're somewhat sophisticated, are going to have all this information when they go forth with their divorce anyway and tell their new lawyer to um, get all this information to use against the other side if it's been disclosed. Yes, but then there are certain uh, terms that everybody, uh, you know, enter into during a collaborative meeting anyways, right? You understand? Of course. When, when a lawyer is doing, a lawyer is doing on a very sophistic sophisticated level. Clients, know, even if they are sophisticated, they do not know how to proceed with family law, right? And this is the reason why, you know, technically collaborative lawyers cannot do it because it's kind of like somewhere, no, no, somewhere I... closer to, uh, you know, like a conflict of interest. Right? You know, I, I, I'm aware that they can't litigate, but I guess the question is if the real fear is that things would be disclosed at the collaborative family that law. Is not the only, that is not the only fear, okay? If that's, mm -hmm. and yeah, that is not the only fear if that's what you're asking. Collaborative lawyers are there, you know, to help assist parties, right? And it's not necessary during collaborative meetings that every party needs to bring in everything on the table, right? Uh, disclosures need not be exchanged in a collaborative meeting. There could be limited amount of disclosure that's uh, you know uh, exchanged because the other party has you know waived it from the beginning, right? But further, this is the reason why I'm saying further down the road, after the agreement has been prepared, further down the road, some party can, comes to know. Oh, okay, you know, obviously we agreed not to disclose it. We agreed to you know waive the disclosure, right? And so I am in such a difficult position right now. So I cannot even sue the other party because I entered into collaborative negotiations, right? So how do I go about doing it? And that is the reason why you're not allowed to actually take your same lawyers into the picture because they can use, you know, they cannot, they cannot mitigate this without, uh, you know, using the information or the knowledge that they had been exposed to during that process. But as you are saying, the clients are sophisticated they can use it yeah unfortunately they can but that's uh, that's not what the lawyers are there for right i mean if they utilize it against the other party well they are they, also they are also uh, you know going to be stopped in court if anything was utilized during the collaborative meetings you're not supposed to disclose anything even in an application when you're filing in court you're not supposed to disclose whatever negotiations were done on a without prejudice basis so in a nutshell, basically, um, the collaborative, the CFL meeting is a close negotiation for the lawyers involved. However, the clients may choose to break the privilege in that case. No, the new no law. Not, I mean, clients have very less in terms of knowledge, right? I mean, they do, you know, even if they're told that, not, that they are not allowed to, to use any of the information in a without right. prejudice meetings, you know, client may or may. it's it's similar to even in the, in another negotiation, and not necessarily the collaborative lawyers negotiation in a regular negotiation as well, right? Like among among a, a regular negotiation process for a separation agreement, right? You could do a four way meeting among each other, right? The lawyer and their client, and the, and the opposing counsel and their client. And if during that negotiation, the very first thing that we talk is that this is a meeting. This is a close meeting. We're not going to be using this against each other at any point. You cannot disclose what remains in here, remains in here for the rest of it. You can never disclose it. So if you try to use the information that was discussed during uh, that process, right? You can be, you know, the other party can get the judge to strike that off at any point. Right, so is there, I mean, definitely there, there will be um, maybe an M MOU formed at the end of such meeting was something that will make the new lawyer further aware that these facts were discussed during a CFA meeting and should not be used in the court, right? That's correct, yes. Okay, yes. okay. I mean, a client can, of course, discuss anything and everything with their client, with their lawyer, right? So, you know, they can discuss everything that happened at the collaborative uh, meetings to their new lawyer, but it is up to the new lawyer not to utilize it right in court you're not allowed to you cannot if you bring that in front of the judge and that it has happened several times when even during motion materials like sometimes people by chance you know by uh, by mistake 
are you know bringing in information that are supposed to be without prejudice and uh, judges do not even look at it judges just disregard it immediately they do not even bother you know if if there are letters if there are communications that were supposed to be a part of the collaborative meeting you're not supposed to bring that ever as an evidence in court it is not an evidence in court understood thank okay. you Anna. yeah, yeah. I don't, did I did I answer your question, all of you? Yes, Ellen. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Perfect. So uh, the next one that I was going to talk about is through negotiations and mediations, right? So that is okay. That's the basic uh, route that every party takes. You know, they, I, I, a child, a client could walk into a lawyer's office and say, you know, I wish to, you know, um, end our marriage. You know, I think, you know, we're ready for a separation. Uh, uh, you can tell me what do I need to do. These are my issues. Whether you can tell me whether you know how to take the process. If you believe a separation process would be faster, a separation agreement would be better off in that uh, process, then you should. Given the new law as of March 2021, every party is actually encouraged. Every client is encouraged to negotiate things or mediate things out of court, attempt everything out of court, and if it doesn't succeed then you should take it to court. Uh, I, I'm, uh, so this is the reason why lawyers are actually now obliged to tell their clients every time they walk into their door, like, look, we at least need to send them an initial letter to, to encourage them to negotiate a settlement. We can try to negotiate a settlement among each other. So in these negotiation processes, when the, when the lawyers are not collaborating lawyers, they are usually communicating with each other via emails, via letters, uh, discussing or, or, uh, or narrowing down the issues that they want to uh, uh, bring it across to each other and see whether you know, they can um, resolve one issue at a time. Okay, so when uh, in, in that in such a process, if you want to start off, you would start off with you know, an initial letter to the other, other party. Uh, you, the other party may not have a lawyer at that point, so obviously you need to send a letter. I always suggest that you start off with sending a registered mail because then you have a track of whether the other party actually received it and simply ignored your letter. Sending via email, there has been issues where they say, oh, it went into my junk mail, I never received it, I don't know anything about it. You can follow up with them a few times and then you've already given them a, a timeline that if you do not respond back a, by a certain time, I'm going to proceed with, you know, uh, taking this matter in an alternative route, which could be taking it to court because the other party is not willing to negotiate. Then you have a better chance to, you know, um, tell the court at any point that negotiation was not possible because the other party did not, uh, you know, even bothered to communicate with you. So that's where that's what you do with the, in the negotiations. There are mediations. Um, if uh, if the client is a legal aid client, you do get to do legal aid mediations, which are uh, quite a reasonable. Uh, if one party is a legal aid client and the other party is not a legal aid client, they can also pay you know for a very minimum minimum price, which is like a hundred or one hundred and fifty dollars or something, and you can do a you know a half a day mediation and try to resolve all the issues. Utilizing a mediator is very good at times. But sometimes it may not even work, in depending on how the um, the parties separated. So in cases where there, you know, there are domestic violence involved, or you know, one party says there it is involved, and the other party says no, you right away know that there is a power imbalance, and never you're going to be able to succeed uh, a mediation without you know you making sure that your client can make sound decisions at that time. Because most of the time in domestic uh, violence cases, one party is so used to being, um, you know, uh, subservient to the other party, they're never able to, you know, um, particularly uh, articulate exactly what they want in that negotiation. So they may just tell their client, they may be passive, saying that, you know, you do whatever is needful, Helen, you know, just proceed with whatever, however you think is correct. And it may not be the proper route because you never know what your client's real intentions are, because tomorrow your client can come back and say, well, this is not, you know, I was not in my, you know, full right mind when I agreed to join decision making, for example. So you need to make sure that your client first clearly understands, and that's the reason why mediation should not be, um, you know, something that you should jump into right away, 
you should initiate first through several uh, uh, rounds of negotiations. And if you think that the parties are really ready for mediations, that is the only time you should try to mediate. You will notice that many lawyers and many family lawyers use mediation as a tactic. So you will see, especially like where, you know, the other party is really um, keen on trying to, you know, hide their resort, uh, you know, hide their funds or whatever it is, or they know that, you know, they can utilize the matrimonial house to, you know, kind of push the other party, um, you know, to sell and put an end to things. Uh, they will push on to for, med you know, for mediation so they can, you know, settle things faster and get rid of it, get rid of everything. And once uh, that is done, you're going to have very less uh, recourse because you will have to find a way out to go back to court if there are certain things that you were not able to mediate properly. So it is very important that you do not jump into mediations. Mediation should be uh, entered into soundly when you know all parties are in the right mind to enter mediation. Um, then the third one is the courts. Obviously, if the mediation fails, if negotiation fails, and the parties are you know poles apart even now, then yeah, uh, I, the court is the route to take. So you have to take uh, the matter to court. You may have to advise the other party's uh, lawyer at that point. Uh, we're no longer willing to negotiate, so we're going to take it to court. So when you're say is sending a statement such uh, of such sort to the other lawyer, obviously uh, the other lawyer um, can use it against you in court. Right. Uh, these uh, certain times when, when you're doing a, throughout the separation process, when you're doing negotiations, not the collaborative lawyers, but the regular negotiations, you make sure that whenever uh, certain information that you're exchanging on each other is without prejudice, you make sure that you title your every letter that this is without prejudice and it cannot be used in court. If you're okay with certain using certain information in court because they are factual or they're evidence based and you do want it to be used in court then you're allowed to you know, not put a heading uh, that is without prejudice. But make sure that if you do not want uh, something where you're, you're offering some, um, you know, some amount uh, in separation, you know, or you're offering some terms in separation, you do not want them to be used against your client, then you may want to make sure that a without prejudice heading is always on top of your letters during these negotiations. Because otherwise, they can utilize it against you through courts when the matter goes to court for cost purposes. So when the parties go to mediation, they're going alone without their lawyers, correct? No, they're going with their lawyers. So the lawyers go to mediation also? Yes, yes. Together with them all the time. Okay, because yes, in yes. some cases... In some cases, I thought that they send the parties just to mediation to a mediator without the lawyers. No, it, it doesn't work that way unless the parties have agreed that way. It's, it's every oh, okay. time no, it's... mediation should be, uh, yeah, your, your lawyer should accompany you because, you know, they can use uh, intimidation tactics. You wouldn't know. Well, of course, the yeah. Mediator, yeah, so if the mediator, you have to understand the mediator is just, is just a person who's getting the information from both sides. If one person is a better negotiator, the other person cannot have his own say, right? So that's the reason why you want to make sure that their lawyers are present. And you, you are aware how mediation works, right? You are put in two separate rooms. You're not supposed to face each other. The mediator just jumps in and out of rooms to uh, bring forth the issues and, and also give their perspective to the other party, right? Look, this is what their position is. And I think they're right because this is what you need to do. So this is my uh, opinion that you may want to settle it this way. You know, that's what the mediator's role is. The mediator is trying to settle this uh, for them, you know, but the media is also trying to ensure that there is no conflict, right? So that's why they're going to keep them separate. So the other party is not intimidated at any point. Okay, so um, that's I how have... family law mediations work. Um, I have a question. Ma yeah. uh, uh, during mediations, if there is a disclosure about uh, disclosure of the certain facts, can those be used in the court of law? No, you cannot. But Mediations if those are, are yeah. say, say, say those are the disclosure regarding the adultery of a spouse, then mm -hmm. whether those can be used during the court because the disclosure has already been made during mediations or negotiations. Well, you know, I mean, why would you as your, uh, why would you yourself uh, disclose about, you know, adultery on the first hand, right? If so if it is, if, 
Yeah. If it is disclosed, say disclosure is not made, if it is disclosed by way of any, uh, say, negotiation or mediations, particularly regarding the personal facts. Yeah, well, if it is an evidence, it's an evidence irrespective of it. If, it. if that was an evidence gathered the right way, you can utilize that evidence, but not the conversations, not the negotiations. So basically, by default, a mediation process is a closed negotiation unless yes. the parties agree to have it open. Open, yes. And that has to be in writing, of course, right? That's correct, yes. Okay, understood. Okay, so most, I mean... 90, 99% of the family courts are closed mediations because there's a lot of baggage involved. This is not similar to civil litigation. In civil litigation, yes, open mediations are possible, but most of the family courts do not uh, want uh, open mediations because they can utilize one, one against each other. Secondly, also uh, to answer your question about um, adultery, I will be uh, talking about it later also. Just wanna let you know the approach that Ontario courts take here it is the approach that all lawyers need to know and understand that this is a no-fault court. Canadian, Canadian courts, family courts are a no-fault court. It doesn't matter if the other person has committed adultery. What the, what the court really wants to do is uh, you know, manage the damage and help the parties separate as soon as possible. That's what the court, it, family courts are there for here in Canada. So uh, obviously you can uh, sue the other party or um, you know, bring in an action against the other party for adultery but, and cruelty uh, because most of the cruelties and adultery uh, can also allow you to expedite your divorce proceedings, but then you will be heavily burdened with uh, providing evidence and the onus is on you who's bringing the application. And 98 to 99% of cases are not cruelty, uh, and even if they are cruelty and adultery based uh, applications, neither of no parties are really asking for immediate divorce unless it's an extreme life and death situation. Okay, so um, okay. That, is, that is something very important that you need to make sure every time you're giving advice to clients that you're aware that this is a no fault court. Uh, that's the reason why in the past, criminal courts proceedings were not even utilized in family courts. Now family courts are open to reviewing the uh, domestic violence related um, uh, criminal um, proceedings, but it is only for the purposes of determining child, uh, you know, child decision making or also probably to de determine spousal support to some extent, but not to, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of, uh, what do you call it? award damages to the other party. There is no real damages in family court. It is not seen like a typical civil court, the family courts in Canada or Ontario, to be precise. So um, I will go back to it again later on uh, if uh, you want to understand what a no fault, fault court is. But just to you know, go on with our uh, today's uh, uh, class, I want to <laughs> stop talking about it and move on. So there are other agreements that as lawyers you will be exposed to. Obviously, domestic contracts is one of them. During marriage, prior to marriage, you can have a prenuptial agreement, uh, which, is, uh, which is also called domestic contract. Um, so domestic contracts can be very much in detail, uh, talking about all the assets, how the parties want to uh, you know, divide their assets, if in case separation happens, or even during the marriage, what are their roles specifically, right? Financial roles, um, uh, child rearing roles, uh, anything in, in, uh, in terms of, you know, titles to properties, any uh, specific thing, you can uh, put it in the domestic contract. And you, you do want to make sure in the domestic contract, it's stipulated that when and how the domestic contract becomes invalid or valid, right, uh, or remains valid. Because if there is a separation agreement that comes into the picture, that can invalidate the domestic contract at, uh, in a future point. So that's why you also want to make sure you want to talk about the separation agreement within the domestic contracts in many points. Temporary or partial agreements are doing negotiations when you're negotiating separation. You may want to enter some temporary or partial agreements during the course. You know, sometimes you may want to just enter a, um, a temporary arrangement for who's going to be with the, who's going to be the parent that the children are going to live with and how the, um, the you know, parenting time is divided among parents. 
Parenting time used to be called access or infant in the past. Now, as of March 2021, it's going to be called parenting time. So that is also something that you may um, you may want to put that down. Anytime lawyers write to each other, it is better to for you to utilize uh, you know um, a form of an agreement, even if it is in a letter form, and then you can get the other lawyer to you know acknowledge and sign off you know, on behalf of their client or their client can sign off even better. Uh, or temporary or partial agreements, for example, okay, you know what, we're entering the separation agreement, but you know, my client cannot afford to pay mortgage. So let's put the house up on sale immediately. So in that case, you may want to enter a partial agreement on how to put the house up on sale. It is extremely important at that point, you need to know some amount of real estate knowledge, because if you do not have the real estate knowledge, what, what's going to happen is the other lawyer can shortchange you in some way or the other. Uh, so you may want to negotiate it down to, well, who's going to select the agent. You may want to uh, figure out how much the uh, percentage the agents are going to be charging. So you may, you uh, among parties, they may decide, like we're not going to go to an agent or uh, agree to uh, you know, sign with an agent who's going to charge more than 4%. So you may need to write that down. And you may need to write down when it's going to be listed, within how many days it's going to be listed when it's going to be sold. If it's not being sold for more than 30 or 60 days, what is the next process? What are you gonna do if the house is there in the market and it's not sold, right? And who is going to pay for these expenses? How the parties are going to pay for these expenses? Is it still gonna come uh, from the joint account? Are the parties going to you know, pay them together, put 50-50 in it? Or uh, you know, the party uh, who is the uh, you know, breadwinner, he's going, he or she is going to you know, continue to pay for um, these uh, expenses and then in the future get credited for it, right? So these are things that you can put in a temporary or partial agreement during the course of negotiation, okay? Well, what, if, what if the parties don't agree, then what does... So if you don't agree, obviously, then uh, you may have to bring in an urgent motion at that point, right? You can bring in an urgent motion for the house sale as well. What, what's the procedure with the court? Do they put it up for sale for auction or do they order that somebody- no, no, the, court orders, the court orders who's gonna make the decision. That's what the court does. So, so the court can say, you know, the motion, you know, so if, if it's supposed, if it is the um, uh, husband in this case, right? If it's the husband who owns, uh, who owns the property, right? But due to domestic violence, he's out of the house. Now the mother and the children are living in the house, okay? And the father is saying that I lost my employment because of this domestic violence issue. I do not have my job anymore. You know, I cannot afford to pay the mortgage. I need to put the house up on sale immediately. She is continuing to dragging it. So I cannot afford. I'm going into further debts, right? The court sees that as an urgent issue. Court doesn't encourage, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, to the other party to continue to incur further debts. Right, unless the other party, then the onus is on the other party to prove, like, no, no, he's hiding money. Like, look, this is where the proof is. This is where the information is. So this is right. what we do in terms of, you know, urgent motions. In that case, but, you will have to bring in an urgent motion where you're going to tell the judge, like, look, this is how I want it to be sold. She's not agreeable to it. This is I'm proposing. This is what my proposal is, and I want the court to approve it. And will the judge always approve it, or will they sometimes say, no, we won't approve it? What happens then? No, most of the time, the judges, like in 85 to 90 percent of the time, judges do put the house upon sale. Judges don't wait or delay that sale of the house. But, but in your example, if the mother and child are living in the house, what do they do with the mother and child that can't afford so the, to move yeah, elsewhere? So what the judge does is like the mother's lawyer can definitely say, right? Well, my, my client does need, you know, a place to stay. What are we going to do? Then the judge may, you know, uh, make um, arrangements like, for example, if she's not working, right, and he hasn't been seeing child support, so then the judge will uh, make an order for child support within that order itself, saying that, like, look, you need to pay this much amount of child support based on your income, right, and this is the amount of spousal support on a temporary basis. This is going to be a temporary order, okay? It's not going to be called a final order. So when you're taking it to court, you're doing this, the judge is going to be like, look, you need to sell the house, fair enough. The proceeds of the house is going to be sold, uh, I mean, going to be held with the real estate lawyer, but certain amount needs to be uh, dispersed right away among parties because they both are in dire need of funds, right? So maybe the judge may agree to 20 or 40,000 to be divided among each other right away. So then, you know, it uh, resolves the party's issues of, you know, whether they're able to, you know, get a rental accommodation 
et cetera. And uh, specifically to your question, what she, what she can do or what the judge will suggest that she should do is the judge will give her maybe like 60 to 90 days uh, closing period. So if you're, the judge will be like, like the house will be listed today. The house will be sold within, uh, I mean, listed for sale. And the minute it's sold, you're going to put it as one of the terms in your agreement of purchase and sale uh, with the, uh, that's what you need to advise the agent that the closing cannot be 30 days or less. It has to be at least 60 days or whatever the judge says, so that it gives the mother and the children enough time to move out of the house. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sort of. What I guess what I was asking is like in your example, you were saying that the father was laid off because of COVID. So he has no income. The wife is not working and the asset is the house. So those are difficult decisions. And even if the judge orders it sold, how does the mother and child move into a different location? And how does the father survive if he's on COVID is what I'm saying. So it's not so easy to just decide that because otherwise you have people that are home. Yeah, so it's again very factual based, right? So I'm just giving an example. If I have to prepare an affidavit, obviously when I'm preparing the affidavit, it'll answer every question that you're asking for, right? I mean, that's what you as a lawyer need to, you know, uh, bring in front of the judge, that you are saying that you are unable to pay for the mortgage because you're yeah, already guess, paying for rent separately, right? You want yeah, to I guess, yeah, I guess I was asking you sort of what the... Um, like the equivalent of a BATNA would be. In other words, what is the judge going to do in a no-win situation? So what is the best thing to do in order to settle it, knowing how something would turn out, so to speak? Uh, uh, what I'm trying to say now then in that case, the judge is not trying to, you know, settle it on a permanent basis. The judge is just doing a temporary solution, okay? Right, but, but I guess I guess that... But I guess what I was asking is what the judge's temporary solution more or less would be, because you would sort of know that going into the mediation and try to negotiate, depending on what side you're on, as close to the center as possible, because it wouldn't make sense if you knew that the judge was going to order the sale, that you're going to say, no, I want to live there forever. But I guess you need to sort of know how the judges are going to decide in general in order to know what a good settlement exactly. would be at mediation. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. And that is exactly what you do in your affidavit preparation. Now, what you're going into is specific details of the case. So that would be right. very, very detail oriented. Like if I have to tell you that, then I have to go into like a specific case and then explain to you like, okay, in this case, this is exactly what happened. So this is exactly yes. what, the what the father had to you know, do. Yes but, if you're, yes, but if you're practicing a lot, you get a feel for more or less what the judges do under certain oh, yeah, circumstances. Of course, of course. And that's really what I was trying to, so and, that's I, really, and that's really what I was trying to ask you because you have to sort of walk into the, um, mediation knowing that because otherwise you don't know if you're getting a good deal at mediation or not well that's what, what you're talking about the judge's decision and you're saying that whether at the mediation you're going to think that the judge is going to make that decision and that's the reason why that's why you're going to propose that at the mediation is that what you're trying to say well normally that's what you would want to yes. do something yes. as close to that as I mean, possible that's what a lawyer is but, supposed to do right so in yeah. order to do that, you need to know which way the judges lean under certain circumstances. Yeah, but then again, that's very circumstantial. It depends on the case. Yeah, okay. but but there's generality. Yeah, yeah, but well, there's generality. Said, in general, well, that's what I said. In general, what I've, what I've said is, if you think that you've been extremely fair by giving the other party, you know, sufficient amount of time to figure this out, you know, and you've been constantly telling the other party, look, let's do this. Let's go ahead and sell the house. Let's divide so and so amount of money and the rest of it, we can hold it on funds. You, you're being very you know, approachable to the other party, right? You, you right. brought everything to the table, yet the other party is just being unreasonable, right? They're just saying, oh, I have nowhere to go. And they're just sitting on it. What are you gonna do? You have to do something about it because you don't want to continue incurring mortgage and other costs, right? Because these are, you know, think about it from the father's perspective. He is not only paying for the mortgage and other expenses, but he's also paying for um, a rent because he's not allowed to stay in that housing. Of course. Yeah. So that's why, you know, the judges do not, even in, in a domestic violence case, the judges do, this is the basic approach in court. Judges do not delay matrimonial home, home sale if 
you're able to prove that there is urgency. There is a lack of funds. There is a possibility that the mortgage company can, you know, um, foreclose your property. So you need to provide the, you know, uh, you don't really need to provide the foreclosure evidence in court necessarily, but you do need to show that there has been default payment, or you do need to show that you're, you're, you know, look, this is my financial statement, right? So you are going to be bringing your financial statement across on the other side, but then the other side is, uh, you know, um, is aware of, and the judge is aware of what your financial position is. And that's the reason why the judge will give you the order at that point to go ahead and sell the house. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to talk about releases. Okay. Um, this is also something that I um, encourage parties to practice. There are many times that uh, parties uh, enter minutes of settlement in court, or there are many times the parties are um, negotiating uh, separation agreements. Separation agreements do have a, a component of releases uh, uh, in it, they, where we are going to talk about spousal release, where either party is going to be releasing each other of any further or future, past, present, or future uh, spousal support uh, claims against each other their estate or even their heirs or anybody, you know, through anybody or through their life insurance policies or any way, okay? So that there are releases that we prepare uh, for that particular reason. But then there are times when you're taking it to court. When we take it to court, parties are able to settle um, things. Uh, even when the matter in court, the parties are still continuing um, to negotiate certain terms. And maybe even before a case conference is scheduled, or even before you attend a case conference, you were able to settle all issues. And in that case, I encourage, um, you know, in my practice, to actually get a, a draft releases signed by parties, you know, on top of the minutes of settlement, which is what the judge is going to be signing. So releases are like mutual releases where either party is releasing each other of spousal um, support or any claims for equalization. So basically, you're going to make sure that nobody's going to sue each other in the future because they've they have reviewed, they have they're satisfied, and they're not going to go after each other and unnecessarily, you know, start a brand new litigation once again. So that is the reason why we um, encourage to do releases. Okay, I can definitely give uh, samples of these releases again. And as I said, releases are a component of separation agreements. Uh, and, to a great extent, where separate in the separation agreement, we talk about equalization release and uh, spousal support relief. And at times, in some very rare cases, child support releases. Okay? Because you cannot, technically, by law, you're not, uh, you cannot really release the other of child support obligation because the court um, kind of, court and the law kind of trumps it. So, but then you are able to release the other party if that party has made, you know, a lump sum payment toward child support well in advance, you know, or something like that. In those uh, rare uh, situations, you can actually do a child support release as well. So that is also something that I will go um, into details of it when we uh, reach to that uh, particular lecture uh, at a later time. Taking it to court, as I had uh, earlier explained, um, the family court for approach uh, for divorces are uh, seen as a no-fault court. So what family court is saying is that definitely in your application, you do need to put uh, forth uh, you know, your issues. But if you are going for a simple divorce, you don't really need to point out each other's faults uh, to, uh, you know, to get the divorce or obtain the divorce. You can, as I said, uh, in cases of cruelty or in cases of adultery, uh, seek an expedited divorce. You can get an immediate divorce. You don't have to wait for the one year uh, separation, uh, which is what the, uh, for, um, the rule stipulates that you need to be separated for one year before you get the divorce. But in such cases where there's cruelty and adultery involved, you can uh, get uh, an expedited divorce, but obviously the onus is on you to provide sufficient amount of evidence and how uh, it, it is detrimental to your life or to you. Um, that is um, something that um, lawyers do not encourage their clients to take that approach and uh, something that is not uh, very prevalent in practice, okay? 
So issue that needs to be narrowed when taking it to court is very, very important. So there will be, because there is a negotiation component now uh, prior to taking it to court, there may be some issues that you were able to resolve. You may be able to do a, a separation agreement, for example, in terms of child support and decision making. And maybe it's only equalization that you need to negotiate out of court, uh, in, in court or you're not able to settle. So it is better off for you to do a separation agreement uh, for the ones that are settled and only take the ones that are not settled to court because that is the most efficient way to take them out of the court. If, um, if you're not able to negotiate anything, then of course you need to take all issues to court. Uh, and that could be your decision-making uh, responsibilities, related questions, and uh, with respect to parenting time, with respect to um, child support, with respect to spousal support, equalization, financial disclosure, and eventually divorce, okay? Uh, you, you do, uh, I'm not sure if you have ever taken a look at the application in a family court. It does expect the applicant to certify that they have attempted to negotiate this matter out of court now. But uh, mind you, in a domestic violence situation where there is an urgent need for you to file an immediate application, you can you know, avoid negotiation, negotiations at that point. But in most, most family court matters, the court is expecting you to have attempted negotiation and you are certifying that you've done your level best to negotiate this out of court, but you are not able to negotiate. And that's the reason why you're in court today, okay? Knowing the correct forms is very important when you then you're taking them out of court. Sometimes you may have to directly bring an emotion in court. Uh, so along with the motion, you may, you know, the, the rule is that you have to file an application prior to bring in any hearing, right? So you may have to bring in an urgent motion along with an application. And in the application, there are several components, which is the application. There's a financial statement that goes along with the application. And there is also an affidavit that goes with the application for uh, custody uh, related issues for the court to see uh, if there are children involved. If there are no children involved, then only a financial statement and the application would suffice. And even the financial statement, there are two types of financial statements. One could be, one is a regular form 13 and the other one is form 13.1. A form 13 is a form that is usually used in Ontario Court of Justice. And form 13.1 is the form that we use in Superior Court of Justice. The reason being is Ontario Court of Justice does not deal with equalization, uh, does not deal with divorce. So if you are taking uh, an issue that is only related to uh, child support and spousal support related issue and decision making and child uh, parenting time, you can directly take it to Ontario Court of Justice. You don't really need to take it to the family court. So this could be from, you know, more suitable for common law spouses or spouses or in, even in marriages where, you know, there's nothing, you know, in terms of equalization that the party uh, wish to equalize. Um, and uh, maybe the parties are not ready for divorce, right? Or they are not even thinking of divorce. They just want to get the separation sorted. So in that case, uh, the Ontario Court of Justice would be the correct avenue to take, okay? So that is also, again, uh, Another thing that we will be uh, going into details of on a later date. Um, the next slide stops for application for divorce. When is the right time to apply for divorce? Only after all the issues are. Uh, may, I, yeah. may I interrupt you for a second? Yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Basically, uh, during the course of our studies uh, for bar exams, we have read about the procedures as well, but we haven't read about the substantive law, like uh, what can be the uh, grounds for separation, what can be the grounds for divorce, and uh, these are substantive issues which we are less familiar with. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you going to provide us something on that as well? Yes, yes. So today is just an introduction uh, uh, lecture, right? So I'm just going overall, like, you know, basically over every um, aspect of family law today, okay? So we will be going into details of, you know, what, how, um, you know, the issues are resolved in a separation agreement. How do we, you know, draft a separation agreement? What are the um, issues that, you know, as you're stating, you know, what are the issues that you mean, you know, that, uh, you know, kind of triggers that this is the time you need to draft a separation agreement 
this is what triggers that you need to take it to court, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I will give you several examples and even, you know, maybe um, case laws or whatever it is for you to, you know, kind of follow as guide. If can, you, can, can you uh, initially recommend us that what's, uh, which acts we should uh, yes, read in I the first instance? That is, that is something that I was going to do as a take home for you all to tell you what uh, rules and uh, acts that you need to start getting familiarized with. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. No problem. Uh, so the application for divorce, as I'm saying, when is the right time to apply for divorce? Only when all the issues have been resolved or if there is nothing else to be resolved. And that is the only time because every client, as I said, walks into your door thinking that, okay, divorce is the only step to take and I just want the divorce. That's not exactly how it works. You do need to uh, advise your client that, look, have you resolved all these issues? What is happening with this? Do you have children? So these are the inquiries that you need to start making prior to you know, proceeding with the divorce. So if all the issues are resolved, then yes, you can proceed with something called a simple divorce. The parties may have entered a separation agreement maybe six, seven years ago, and they had thought like, you know, at that point, not to proceed with the divorce, they just want to do a separation agreement and move on in their lives. And now the parties are, you know, one is one of them wanted to proceed, you know, move on in their life. And then they walk into your office saying that, look, I've, I've done a separation agreement in the past. Uh, I just want to proceed with the divorce. So then at that point, it is your due diligence to review that separation agreement to see if everything is fine, then you can do your necessary inquiries if that separation agreement actually uh, dealt with all the issues. Because there are times when the separation agreement only dealt with child support, child custody, and uh, spousal support. Maybe it never even touched base with equalization. Maybe then at that point, you may want to guide your client that, you know, uh, maybe you want to do an equalization release so he, doesn't, he or she doesn't come after you for equalization payment. You may want to do that prior to proceeding with the divorce. Or if they do not want to do that, you may want to get a disclaimer or, you know, you may want to get like some sort of uh, agreement or acknowledgement from your client in writing that you have advised your client, but they have chosen not to take that route, right? This is just to protect yourself as always. So every time at every step, you may want to take things in writing from your client because that is the only way you can protect yourself. At many times, this is what happens. The clients can come back saying that you never told me that. So that is a very, very important thing that you must remember. Uh, a simple divorce is basically then the first step that you can take. You can, fi you can file the regular uh, simple divorce in court, and then you can serve the other party. Um, you can serve the divorce within Canada or outside Canada. If the opposing party is uh, living outside Canada, you can serve. And, that's, and they are allowed 60 days to respond. And if it's within Canada, it's 30 days for them to respond. If they do not respond with a uh, two-year divorce, then you can proceed with something called an uncontested divorce, where you know they have not responded. So you can file your affidavits accordingly to the judge and tell the judge, well, the other party has not responded. I wish to proceed with my divorce. And uh, the judge will uh, take your affidavit into consideration, and the judge will proceed with granting you uh, a divorce. OK? Anybody have a question? Yeah. So please. Why David, you go ahead. I was going to say, why would the parties really want to enter into a separation agreement without knowing that they're going to be divorced shortly thereafter? In other words, why would they engage in a separation agreement and wait seven years to file a divorce? I understand that in some cases it could be because they have to remain on the insurance or the pension or something. Or in other cases, they can't resolve the issues and they need to come to an agreement and then get divorced. But why usually have that big of a gap between having a separation agreement and then a subsequent divorce? Oh, well, there are many, many, many reasons. Everything is, again, of very personal to every individual. There could be many reasons. One of the one, one very common reason is also religion uh, related, where, uh, you know, um, in certain religions, they do not want to divorce each other, right? They don't want to have a divorce. That could be simply that that is the reason why they, you know, separated, but they never divorced each other officially. So that is also something that you may want to, you know, respect, you know, because that is the client's, you know, wish, right? They didn't want to proceed with the divorce. But then the other person, six months, six years down the road, realized they they have a new partner in their life and they want to get married. So now they have they're reconsidering their position. And that could be basically the main reason why they want to. Go ahead and file for divorce today. 
But at that point, they agreed that they do not want to, you know, proceed with the divorce. So whenever we're drafting a separation agreement, obviously we put a term, right, as to how the parties can proceed with the divorce. So we always, uh, the most commonly used term is this, saying that either party can proceed with an uncontested divorce. So what we are saying here is that, you know, anybody can proceed with a divorce at any point in their life. A divorce can be granted anytime. It, it doesn't mean that you have to get a divorce immediately. It can be granted at any point. There are many, many, many marriages uh, where they just choose to remain separated. They do not want to get divorced. So basically separation agreement, once it's formed, it will give either party a right to proceed to get an ex parte uh, divorce decision? Uh, yes, separation agreement uh, not just gives you a right to proceed, but protects you uh, against any unnecessary claims in the future, right? Well, so but, yeah. But, yeah. yeah, but isn't that only if the separation agreement is all encompassing? If the separation agreement only deals with some of the issues, then the other issues still need to be resolved. So it may exactly. not totally be an uncontested divorce. It still could yes. be contested yes. on the issues not addressed in the agreement. Yes. Yeah, you're right. But there are times when the other party may just tell the court otherwise, right? So I've, I've, met, I've had issues where I have faced uh, where one client showed up uh, to me saying that I did not know I was divorced for the past five years. Right? So then you have a client who actually is claiming that the other, parts, the other party proceeded with an uncontested divorce in court, but this party never even received a copy of the simple divorce form because they were supposed to be served. Right? And they were yeah. able to file an application in court. They even uh, filed an affidavit of service in court saying that, you know, look, we served the other party. This is the proof of service. How do I proceed now? I just want to proceed. And the judge, you know, based on the evidence that was given, the judge believes what you said, right? The judge does not go into the details of things unless and until there are children involved. Okay, so when you're filing an application in court, there is a portion in that in every divorce application where you're talking about the children, how many children are there, and uh, is a, a child support arrangement made. If a child support arrangement has not been made or decision making arrangement has not been made, then the judge will not allow you to go proceed with an uncontested divorce. The judge will want you to resolve that first and then only proceed with the divorce. Okay. The judge doesn't really uh, delve into your equalization or spousal support because those are your own uh, rights. And that is something that you may want to bring it in front of the judge's attention if you believe that it is not being uh, completed. But the other party can definitely proceed with the divorce if you have not raised an issue on the um, uh, divorce. I mean, on the uh, uh, you know equalization. Uh, another thing that I want to bring it to your attention is that uh, the minute you separate, you have six years limitation period to seek uh, everything in terms of equalization and spousal support claims within that six years period. If you pass that six, year, six years limitation period, you cannot make those claims. You have to give a lot of justification to, you know, um, uh, to the court why the judge should li uh, lift that limitation. Okay. And same thing goes with divorce. So if you're separated, you went ahead with drafting a separation agreement and then you got a divorce, then your limitation period is actually narrowed down to two extra periods. That's it, two extra years. So after divorce, you have two years to seek all the reliefs <coughs> even after divorce. So basically what uh, the court is doing here is allowing the other party who did not know about an uncontested divorce to come forward saying that, oh, okay, this, you know, there was a divorce granted, but we never equalized our property. You know, that needs to be sorted, right? And then that is the reason why you have a limitation period of two years that you may want to bring that to the court's attention at that point. Okay. And then the third one that I'm talking about is a joint divorce. Contested is, of course, as I said, the other party will respond and say, look, I, I don't think that we, sh we should be, you know, proceeding with the divorce because he hasn't sorted, you or he or she hasn't sorted, uh, you know, child support, spousal support. We haven't, uh, you know, dealt with our matrimonial home or these issues are still outstanding. 
they will file yes I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. Um, uh, going a little bit back towards equalization limitation, right? Mm -hmm. When you say it's six years after separation, does it mm -hmm. mean the clock starts ticking from the time um, you separated irrevocably or from the date of separation agreement? No, it's from the date of the actual separation. So in the separation agreement, you will mention that this is the date of separation. So that is the date uh, when the time clock begins. So if, in some cases, you don't enter a separation agreement, right? I mean, the party yeah. was separated. They were just living under the same roof. They never did anything about it, right? And then suddenly the other party has uh, proceeded with, you know, going ahead with the divorce. So then, you know, you, you then need to bring it in, uh, in front of the judge, you know, to bring it to the judge's attention. Look, we were separated for so long, right? But we were only separated for the past four years, but I still, I'm within the two-year limitation period to seek the rest of the stuff. So I'm going to proceed with seeking everything at that point. So that's how separation date works. You, uh, separation dates are very highly contested at many times in court. Yeah. Uh, you know, one spouse could have one date as a separation agreement. The other spouse could have one date as a separation agreement. And that is also something uh, parties usually bring it at a motion or a trial, and the judge determines as to what is the correct date. Exactly was my next question, as in probably the period of three months separation that formally legalizes the separation as such, uh, brings up a lot of issues when it comes to separation day, because it could happen to parties where they have separated um, for a period of three months and they may go back and forth in that yes, case, in that case, those dates will not be applied. Yes. Okay. Okay. Understood. Okay. So within three years, within three months period, if the parties reconcile, you cannot utilize that date as the separation date. But okay. But yeah. also, what happens if you have a partial separation agreement and then the parties live apart for, let's say, an excess of six years, mm -hmm. and not all the issues have been addressed? doesn't that present a problem because the statute of limitations has run and no one has really addressed those issues? Yes, yes, that will be a big problem. You will have to address that in court if, if the other party brings it in court. If the so, other, if, yeah, so, so if a lawyer drafts a settlement agreement and they don't address all the issues, they're almost putting themselves at risk for malpractice because if the party doesn't do anything, and that wasn't dealt with, it's a big problem, even no, for the lawyer that was. No, that is the reason why you as a lawyer will at every point, make sure that you write, you get a disclaimer completed from your client at that point, right? Because you want the client to know that, look, you only retained me and you only told me that you only want to deal with these issues at this point. You have told me specifically not to deal with your equalization. You have been advised that there is a six year limitation period and so and so so date will be your end, right? So you, you, if you need to make any decisions, you do need to make your decisions within that period of time. You are doing that, and it, that is a part of your retainer agreement. When I provide you a copy of the family law retainer agreement, you will see it encompasses that as well in a private retainer. Helen, yeah. um, now also I have a question. Now, for example, in a scenario where after, say, four months, okay, the mm -hmm. parties kind of start living together again. Mm -hmm. Now, say it after a couple of months again, they separate, right? Now yeah. we need to keep in mind that the, the separation continues further because three months are already complete in the first mm -hmm. phase of separation, right? So, so if, say for example, after four months, I go back to my ex, right? Yes. So, from, yeah. so, so in the sixth month, it will be counted fourth month of my yeah. separation and not as first month again, because I'm not starting from the scratch again after three months, it will be continued process. So it will be my fourth month. Now, my, my, my equalization will be counted from the first month when the separation actually began in, in the previous phase, right? Yes, that's correct, yes. Okay, understood. So yeah, so just to uh, um, elaborate on what others can say here is that, uh, so if you separated, suppose on September 1st, oh, okay. And then uh, you, uh, 
that you pass the three months period, but six months down the road, you reconcile. Okay, but your reconciliation period has to be minimum of three months, at least. If your reconciliation period is less than three months, it is considered through courts and family uh, in family law that you basically did not reconcile. Does it make sense? So then your separation agreement, uh, your separation date will still remain the same day that it was six months before. And every calculation has to be done from the date of separation, not from the new reconciliation date. Okay, does it make sense, Abba? Yes, Helen, all good. Okay, perfect, perfect. So I'm just gonna browse through uh, the other things because I believe we are running short of time. I'm not sure if I have to end the today's um, session. Uh, the other things that we're, we're gonna be talking in details of as to when and how certain corollary reliefs need to be sought in court would be you know, uh, next that I'm talking about, which is first would be the children of marriage, right? Uh, what are the reliefs that you seek through courts or in separation agreements? The first one is decision-making responsibility, which in the previously, it was known as custody. So parties used to have sole, joint, or shared custody. Now it's basically sole, joint, or shared decision-making responsibility. So sole decision-making responsibility, basically, it's just as it states. Uh, the, only one party is uh, making all the decisions. Okay. Uh, but, but even in such decision-making responsibilities, the other party can still have access to third-party information. That is also something that you can negotiate or put it in terms. Uh, in joint decision making, uh, both parties are making every decision jointly. So, uh, you know, there could be one parent that the children are living with. So, every time that parent is supposed to do something, they will communicate the same uh, via text or via email to the other party. And um, then they will communicate whether they agree or disagree to the other party and then try to make these decisions. So these decisions are basically revolving around the welfare of the children. So which school they need to go to, if there is a medical appointment, how to you know, go about uh, either that medical appointment, maybe the doctor has suggested a certain prescription, you know, a certain medication. One parent is agreeable, the other party, the other parent is not agreeable, how do you resolve it? These are the things that joint decision-making responsibilities deal with. In shared decision-making, it's very uh, rare, but it is something that uh, parties practice. One parent takes care of education, the other party, the other parent takes care of medical. So then therefore, you know, you have less in terms of conflict. If there is high conflict, that is also another way that parties can do decision-making, it is through shared decision-making. Uh, another thing with respect to children that you may want to uh, deal with is because that's what the new law is allowed to is contacts with others. When we're talking about contacts with others, it's other people other than the parents. So we're talking about grandparents, we're talking about relatives, we're talking about, uh, you know, it could be, you know, the other party's uh, new partner, you know. So how, how will the children remain in contact with the other third parties is also something that you may want to address it. So now uh, the law allows these third parties also um, to bring in an application for contact. So a grandparent, for example, now is allowed to bring in an application simply for uh, having contact with the children. If, you know, the, um, suppose the maternal, uh, the, the mother is not allowing contact with the paternal grandfather or paternal grandmother. So that's when the, uh, the paternal grandparents can bring in an application just simply for contact with the children. They cannot come in for parenting time, but they can definitely ask for contact and they can uh, negotiate a contact periods with the, with the other party, or they can ask the court to, uh, you know, in the form of motions or anything, you know, to prove how they've been involved in the child's life and how their presence is so important in the child's life, okay? The third one is parenting time, where uh, there are diff different uh, steps in parenting time in uh, very high conflicted uh, situations where, you know, the, uh, you know, one parent is worried about the other parent's uh, parenting skills, then they can uh, suggest or, you know, want to have supervised parenting time. It could be utilizing any third parties that they like. Uh, uh, 
it could be maybe they trust the other parties, you know, um, a brother or sister or a parent, and they can say, so long as the parents are, uh, you know, aware, aware, I'm okay, uh, are available, they're seeing and they're overlooking it, I'm okay giving you supervised access of the children. Uh, it, that is one way of doing supervised parenting time. Another way of doing supervised parenting time is utilizing the supervised access centers, which are formal access uh, center settings where they do um, supervise and they make notes and uh, they make detailed notes. So if you want to utilize, you can use those notes in courts in future as evidence to show whether you know you want to you know continue having a supervised access or the supervised parents can also utilize it to show that there is no real need to have a supervised access because the child and the father have, or the child and the mother have a great bond and they are able to show those bonding through these notes. Uh, unsupervised parenting, simply uh, the other parent doesn't really have any uh, supervised parenting. So the parents are just, you know, um, sharing parenting time. Uh, they can, uh, in, even in unsupervised parenting time, it can be um, kind of like a gradual process to give the other parent uh, parenting time if there was only one parent who was actually, you know, the primary caregiver of the child. So then the other parent will get an unsupervised parenting time. Uh, and there should be, there would be an overnight parenting time uh, once they have gradually reached that position where the, you know, where they think like, okay, the child is ready to go, uh, uh, you know, into overnight parenting, then the other parent will get like overnight weekends uh, or even during weekdays, once a day, uh, once a weekday in school times. Uh, shared parenting time is basically both parents are sharing equal um, parenting time or even, you know, a certain percentage, 70, 30 or whatever it is that they have arranged among each other. Uh, usually uh, in shared parenting time, it's most of the time 50-50 where parents um, have you know, their own arrangements if they're able to settle or negotiate among each other. Or if it's through courts, uh, they will have something, um, either if, the, if there's an OCL lawyer involved, that the OCL lawyer has suggested that this is the appropriate parenting time for uh, the parties to share, then that would be the shared parenting time um, that the court will you know, agree to provide or give it to the um, parties. So shared parenting time could be, um, two to two to three, that is a very common one also that we use. Basically two days with one parent, two days with the other parent, three days with the, third, uh, the other parent again, and then rotate. So um, that's a very common one that 50-50 uh, uh, parenting, uh, shared parenting utilizes. So Helen, when yeah. we talk about shared decision-making, it means mm -hmm. the issues will be shared, will be split rather, right? That's correct, yes. Okay, so for example, um, one party will be making educational decisions while the other party will be making medical decisions, something of that's that. That's correct, yes, okay. that's correct. Okay. Yes. So corollary reliefs, uh, I'm continuing it. Now I'm talking about child support, where I'm talking about child support that could be paid by one party, child support that could be shared by both parties because one party, you know, both parties having one child each, or it could be that both parties are sharing uh, parenting time, so therefore they have to share child support as well. And uh, this is always calculated based on the federal guidelines, which I believe you all uh, are aware of how to do the federal guidelines calculation. There is an entire chart that you can find. I will be uh, providing those links uh, in the future so you can know uh, where to find that guideline and how to read them. Uh, again, if you get a software which is called Divorce Made Software for, for family lawyers, this is what family lawyers usually um, purchase, the Divorce Made software. It does have the Divorce Made calculation, which calculates child support. Uh, you may, uh, most of the calculation is done based on notice of assessment of parties. So if there is, you know, if there is a notice of assessment of a self-employed individual, it's very difficult to uh, calculate child support in that case because that person is self-employed and they may just report 20,000 or 19,000 as their income, but in reality, they're receiving much more than what it is because as a self-employed individual, they can you know, get a lot of deductions done. So that is when we do a lot of financial disclosure. We ask the other person's fee on generals. We ask quite a lot of information from the other party. And uh, we can determine as to how much the amount has to be imputed by. 
you have to also be mindful uh, how to calculate that because that is very important when you take that to court. So for example, in, in many cases, uh, the very common one, uh, the ones that we use uh, most commonly in brand reports and stuff like that is that uh, many uh, um, the corporations uh, are set up by the um, self-employed individual. And uh, you know when they give you the T1 generals, you can see that they've you know, charged their meals, their cell phones, they, they've charged many things against them. Uh, gas also, it depends on whether the gas is used for the business purposes, then yeah, you can calculate it to add or subtract. So you have to basically decipher everything one step, one by one to make your own uh, calculation estimate of what is, what is the real income of this individual. And then you need to pre uh, present it to the court or the other party as to how much do you think he or she should be imputed uh, in terms of uh, child support or spousal support for, uh, for the purposes of calculating uh, these um, support payments. You will notice that in the federal guidelines, it also says that if income is about 150,000, there is no federal guideline. You can impute uh, the income just based on their you know, income. Uh, so you may have to do that calculation. But let me tell you, even though it says, even though the federal guideline says that about $150,000, you don't really have like a federal guideline, we still follow the federal guideline calculation system to seek child support and spousal support, especially because many individuals' income uh, are, you know, uh, are pretty much straightforward, even if it's about 150, suppose it could be 200,000 or even 300,000, it can still be calculated very easily. So therefore, even the judges are not willing to impute a much higher income than what the, uh, I mean, much higher support payment amount than what the federal guideline would have calculated had you put you know, that particular income in there. So you, then you need to convince the judge why the child support or the spousal support should be you know, much higher than what uh, the guideline says. So the reason being is, uh, the judge is uh, well aware of, you know, how the current economics is and how people live in the current society. So if you are claiming a, a higher amount, suppose in, in 150 calculation, if you use the same calculation method as a federal guideline, and according to 150, you are uh, entitled to make a, a child support payment of 1500, suppose, or, or 1500. But you're asking the court, no, I do not want $1,500, I want $2,000 or I want $2,500. You need to justify why you want that extra $1,000. Maybe because the child is going to private school. So then you may have to incorporate that and you have to provide evidence that this is the lifestyle that the um, parent has um, you know, provided to the children for so long. So, you know, to change their entire lifestyle is very unfair, given the fact that the parents are still earning that particular earnings. And then you may be able to succeed in getting a much higher child support or a spousal support claim, uh, much higher than what the federal guidelines um, provide you. But once again, it is a very narrow approach. Judges do not really entertain that and unless and until you're able to really, you know, uh, convince the judge to do so. And for and then, so yes. basically when we were talking about $150,000, is that yes. like a default benchmark that um, anything above than that would need evidence in court? No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that uh, federal, guide, uh, federal guidelines are saying that anything above uh, 150000 you can figure out among yourself. The court, uh, the, you know, there's no specific guideline for it. Okay, so that in that case, the parties yes. themselves will be deciding as to yes. how the supports yes. will work. Yes. The yes. courts are only entitled to decide on a benchmark of $150,000. Anything about that will be decided amongst parties. Yeah, so but, but, then the, but then I'll tell you the practice, the norm of practice in court though, so even if there is a party um, uh, earning $200,000, okay, not, you know, so it's about $150,000. You're still going to, you know, calculated exactly the way a federal guideline would have calculated the child support to figure out how much child support this person, this individual owes based on the 200,000. Okay. 
Okay, right? understood. And then yeah. that is what your uh, base child support is. So if you want more than that, you will have to justify it to the judge. So how it goes is like, it'll be divided. Basically, the 200,000 will be divided. The first 150 will be calculated based on the child support amount, right? Based on the federal guideline. Anything excess, right? Has to be done, has to be convinced through the family, uh, through the judges, that that 50,000 should also, you know, should not apply using the federal guidelines, but should be applied, you know, just, you know, using, you know, just an imputed number that you think that, uh, you know, should be given to you, given that you have a different lifestyle that you've been leading for so long. So either, so basically, for example, in the same case of two hundred thousand dollars, yes. For the first hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I'll use my whatever software and whatever calculate for the parties. Mm -hmm. And for any excess amount, I would tell them, look, either you can decide it amongst yourselves, or I can for even even for the excess amount, I can calculate on the software and let you know what you can do about it. Yeah, basically, basically, what the court wants you to do is do the hundred and fifty based on the you know uh, federal guidelines. And the remaining 50 also do it based on the federal guidelines, right? And put them together, right? But then if you want anything more than that, you need to kind of negotiate among each other if you can come up with a better number. If not, then you'll have to convince the judge that, you know, the other party is not willing to give you beyond what the, you know, guideline calculations are. You get what I'm saying now? Okay, but that uh, convincing the judge of, I mean, it comes into picture beyond $150,000 calculations. That's right? correct, yes. Okay, yes. okay. And the next one is section seven expenses. So section seven expenses is, uh, is um, we call it section seven expenses because these are extraordinary expenses other than the regular child care, expense, you know, child support expenses that uh, the paying party has to pay. So these extraordinary expenses are uh, out of the ordinary expenses. Uh, so if in case, in, uh, in, in one case, you know, uh, they have to incur daycare expenses, the parties have to share that expense. If both parties are earners, then they must share the daycare expenses uh, or any of these expenses based on their propo uh, proportional to their income. So either party could be, you know, one person could be making 70%, uh, more than the other, so then they will be paying 70% more in the daycare expenses uh, than the other person. The other person will be paying you know, the 30%. Uh, same goes with the dental, medical, optical prescription. First of all, what we usually try to do is to see whether you know um, they have benefits covering these expenses through their plans. If both parties have benefits covering through their plans, they will utilize their benefits and anything excess, they will try to divide among each other. And then there are educational and activity, uh, educational activities, which could be, you know, through school or even, um, you know, other extracurricular activities, you know, such as swimming lessons, music lessons, and other lessons that the children want to go to. I've put in RESP plans, but it's technically, it's very, very, it's almost uh, uh, impossible to get it enforced through family courts, unless the parties have agreed to and put it as part of the minutes and the judge will sign off but the judge will never force any parent to take up RESP plans, okay? Uh, CRA-related benefits is again another thing, which is I'm talking about specifically the child care benefit. That is also, again, uh, beyond the family court. That is federal, uh, federally regulated. So that is something that the CRA and the federal government deals with. The family court will never um, you know, make any orders forcing any party to do otherwise. All these expenses, Section 7 expenses, and these child support and everything can be enforced uh, various ways. Either the parties can directly pay each other or they can enforce it through the Family Responsibility Office, which is also called the FRO. Uh, they are the ministry, and through ministry, you can get these issues. So whenever you're getting your uh, separation agreements drafted, then you have to make sure that if it deals with child support uh, payments and section seven uh, expense payments, you wanna make sure that the separation agreement is actually filed in court. Uh, there's a specific form that allows you to file separation agreements in court, and then you can get uh, a support deduction order uh, done where you can provide the separation agreement to the family responsibility office and the family responsibility office will go ahead and uh, get it enforced. 
And if it is a court order, again, the court order will have a support deduction order that the judge will sign off, and then you will present that to the family responsibility office. One will be sent to court, one will be sent to you, and then you will get that uh, enforced. And then they will go after the paying party to make sure that they pay on time. So the Section 7 expenses are in addition to the child support tables, that's correct? Correct. Yes, that's correct. So what happens are they considered child support or they're not really considered no, child support? No, they're not support? considered child support. They're additional. They're called extraordinary expenses. That's why we call them Section 7 expenses or extraordinary expenses. And they will, if you are able to negotiate a certain number that is going to be uh, taken on a monthly basis, then you can get that enforced through Family Responsibility Office. But most of the time, Section 7 expenses do not get really do not really get enforced through family responsibility office because it is a monthly thing or it could be sporadic. So whenever uh, you know one party incurs that expense, it is their responsibility to provide a copy of that invoice to the other party. And based on their agreement, they will pay whatever their proportions are to the other party to pay them off. So what's the enforcement mechanism though if they don't? To go in on a motion, of course. So yeah, so you have to then go through the motion in court and then uh, show the courts all the proof that you know you had entered a separation agreement where you know he or she had agreed to pay the section seven expenses, but you've been providing the invoices diligently according to you know the separation agreement terms, but the other person has not, and therefore you've incurred so much amount in uh, section seven expenses that you know he or she owes you. Now suppose he or she owes you more okay. than four thousand or you know five thousand, then you may want to bring it to the judge's attention. Right? But the other because side will come in and say that they can't afford it because let's say they've had a reduction in income and so forth. So what are the now chances of getting motion, no 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 then that is a motion to change. Then they have to bring in something called a motion to change to change their whole uh, perspective because then they have to do a recalculation. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay? So yeah. What you're talking about is a totally different thing then. Um, right, but wouldn't the one usually be met with the other, basically, meaning that if somebody argues you're behind and if they're substantially behind, then there's a reason they're going to bring that up at the same time. Not necessarily. Sometimes some are, some are just vindictive. And, uh, and in some cases, if they are, then it is their obligation to go get that uh, reviewed. So they should have reviewed it, right? They should have gotten it reviewed. They should have gotten their separation agreement reviewed or amended. Or what they should have done is, if you're not able to negotiate it, then bring in something called a motion to change. We can do a motion to change a separation agreement. That's yeah, but do. usually what would happen if the husband, let's say, lost his job, he would say, I didn't have enough money to get a lawyer. I couldn't do this. You know, I was basically scrambling for dear life because I lost my job because of the virus and I can't make mm -hmm. any income. And I was looking for a roof over my head. How could I bring mm -hmm. in any motion? So now here I am, Judge. What do I do? That's what's that's usually. Not, that's not a, that, no, that's not a good. Uh, uh, what do you call it? If you're talking about an argument, it's not a good argument. The judge is not going to buy it. Even if it's true, what if the person lost their job and didn't have any money? And how were they supposed to do anything? Most most family courts, you once you start embarking family family law, you realize that is the most common argument. So imagine if yeah. every family judge is presented with that argument and every family judge has to just allow that ha to happen, then the uh, recipient will never get any support from it. But it is provable if someone is working and they were let go, then... Yeah, but then you also have a responsibility to show what did you do to find a new job. Well, it's not easy now, of course, for yeah. a lot of people. So what, you, what you're going into is the details of it, which I will go into details of it to figure out these are arguments, of, of course, that you would need to present it to court, right? And how you're going to present it to court right. or something. Yeah, we will go into details of it so you know exactly how to present in such situations. So, Helen, um, yeah. our ESP and the CRA related benefits, right? These yeah. two topics will be covered too. Uh, I will cover them. So, for, for knowledge purposes, right? Because you as lawyers, you're supposed to still advise your client. Even these are these are things that you will put it in the in your retainer agreement to advise your clients, right? About the RESPs, about the RSPs, about their uh, child uh, child care benefits. Because most of the time, to, to, uh, parties are not aware of these things, right? So you're supposed to give them some awareness around it, and you're supposed right. to give them guidance around it. But so, you cannot enforce these in courts. 
unless and unless, unless and until both parties are consenting to it, then that's fine. Then the so, judge is willing to put it on the border. So only in case of RESP and CRA related benefits, we cannot enforce them in courts, right? And not, not like you can't bring in a motion basically against the other person to force that person to pay RESP unless they agreed to do that. They made an agreement in a separation agreement because then you can bring it calling it as a breach of a separation agreement. Okay, so yeah. but only in the in the case of these two factors, we cannot bring a motion. Yeah, you can't you can't force anybody to contribute into an RESP fund. If you want to contribute, you can contribute. You cannot force someone else to contribute. Basically, that's what it is. And even in uh, CRA benefits, we can't, of course, because it is the CRA that makes those decisions, right? So the judge can't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but what in case of the other Section Seven expenses? Those are fine. We can bring a motion in. Yeah, respect in those, those other ones, you can definitely bring in motions in case of, uh, you know, when you can prove for sure that you know it, it is a very, very, very important uh, expense, right? Okay. In your in that particular situation, in that client situation, My, be mindful. Section Seven expenses are very difficult to get uh, from courts because the judge cannot force the, you know more and more payment on the payer. Right, so the the judge is very reluctant to um, give a huge amount in Section Seven expenses. Daycare expenses are very uh, are much easier to get. Uh, dental, medical, also very easy, much easier to get. But activities, uh, extraordinary ex activities, judges sometimes draw a line. Maybe like you know you cannot have because sometimes some parents go overboard. They can have like expensive summer um, camps. Some parents go overboard, sending their kids to you know. $2,500 or $3,000 or $4,000 worth of summer, um, uh, you know, what do you call it, summer activities. And then the paying parent is, you know, like, you know, what the hell, why did you do that, right? Like, I'm not able to pay that. Why did you put me in a situation where you're, you know, you know that I'm, I'm being forced to pay 70% here. So now I have to pay, you know, the whole brunt of it. And I do, I'm not in a position or a situation to pay for it, right? So this is the reason why Section 7 expenses are dealt with in a very um, tight uh, way, where, you know, one party has to seek the other party's consent prior to, ex uh, you know, proceeding with that expense. And in some cases, they're allowed to go without consent, but it's a very, very, um, uh, you know, very selective cases where one party has, you know, constantly refused to pay Section 7, and you have sufficient proof to show the judge that, like, you know, that, that person will never contribute to even daycare expenses. And therefore, you are not able to go to work. And that's the reason why you want that data expense also to be enforced to FRO. And that's when you bring in, you know, a motion in court. Thank you, Helen. Okay. Yeah, no problem. So uh, I'm going to, you know, bra uh, skim through things very fast now. Uh, corollary, uh, another set of corollary issues that we're going to be talking about in the future is spousal support. Uh, spousal support, 98% of the time in courts are need-based. Right, it is based on your financial needs. So, if you are in dire need of financial um, help or assistance, that's when you are, you know, um, you know, you receive spousal support. Your entitlement to spousal support is uh, proven through, you know, the duration of your marriage. So, if you have a very short-lived marriage, uh, just a year or two years or three years marriage. It's very difficult for you to get uh, spousal support unless and until you can show that there is a reason why you're not able to be employed. And that's the reason why you want the other person to support you. And these support, uh, spousal supports are, again, very um, short lived spousal support. The duration uh, of these spousal support would be very less, maybe like a year or two maximum. And then that's about it. Uh, you know, in very rare circumstances, you're able to get spousal support indefinitely, even through life insurances or um, through estates and uh, so on and so forth. Compensatory based uh, spousal support is where, you know, I was talking about damages. Remember, uh, I was talking about the fact that, you know, you can bring in cruelty and adultery as one of the way to um, expedite your divorce. And in those cases, sometimes you can actually see compensatory based spousal support as well, where you're going to ask the court, uh, you know, compensation for, you know, uh, you know, the, because the physical assaults to you of physical damage has physically damaged you to, to the extent that you're not able to, you know, 
uh, you know, utilize uh, you know, a certain part of your body, for example, your fingers, or you know, or you are in, uh, you know, you you are sick and you're not able to work any further because of the um, atrocities of the other person. So in those cases, you're able to get compensatory damages. And that is basically exactly the way how tort law works. You apply the same um, tort law uh, application here to calculate the damages, and then you're able to uh, get an extra uh, damages on top of the you know, financial assistance that you're going to get. So you may be able to get a compensatory uh, damage uh, spousal support, and you may be able to get a need-based damage, uh, need-based spousal support. Uh, so the mostly compensatory damages are, you know, um, you know, an award, right? So it could be just like you know, ten or fifteen or twenty thousand uh, dollars in full payments to the uh, to you for compensation. That's how it goes most of the time. Disclosure requirements: When you are asking for spousal support, you are obliged you are obligated to provide your disclosure because you're asking spousal support. So you have to provide all your financial financials. You have to provide um, you know, uh, your medical evidence. If you are claiming you know, you're not able to work because of medical uh, circumstances, you are, provide, you are asked to provide. And if the opposing uh, party's uh, lawyer asks for such disclosure, you should provide it promptly. Otherwise, it can be detrimental to your client's uh, spousal support claim. Enforcement against spousal support is also enforceable through FRO. And that is uh, you know, enforceable exactly the same way how child support can be enforced. But it has to be uh, written uh, in an agreement or in a court order for the FRO to enforce it. So compensatory uh, is actually a damage awarded, right? Exactly. It's That's correct. Okay. It's a damage. It's a tort. Basically, tort. Because it is because of that person that you are suffering psychologically and physically and emotionally and whatever the reasons may be. But that's why the threshold, you have to understand the threshold of tort law. The threshold at this point, I, do, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think it's somewhere close to $40,000. So if you're not able to prove that your damage is much more than $40,000, you do not have a compensatory damage claim there. And that is in addition to need-based support as usual. That's correct. Yes. Okay. 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 So corollary release again continued. Now we're going to talk about equalization payments. Uh, equalization payment is basically, uh, you know, you have to do a net family property calculation, which you can only do it once parties are disclosing their financial disclosure. So both parties have to provide their finances. Uh, the other party's lawyer can go uh, as far back as possible. Sometimes they are able to go five years or even six years or seven years back if they have a specific claims against you against your client uh, for you know for example depletion of assets they're thinking that you've hidden uh, your client has hidden assets and was able to buy properties out of the country or somewhere else so they may be able they may be asking or seeking uh, disclosures uh, as far back as possible so whenever they ask if you think it's unreasonable, you can definitely respond back saying that it's unreasonable. So you now you need to figure out whether what is reasonable and unreasonable in um, uh, you know, a request for information from your client. And you can do the same, of course. You can make a request for information to the other side, and you will ask for those a disclosure uh, prior to embarking into doing the equalization payment negotiation. So once the parties have um, exchanged their financials, exchange the financial statement, exchange all the medical, financial, all the information, then they will do something called a net family uh, property calculation, which is called an NFP. And in that, they will be able to do, um, you know, the equalization payment uh, calculation where they'll put both parties um, assets and liabilities on the date of separation. And then they'll be able to come up with a number that you know your obviously your number may be different to the other party's counsel's number and then that's where you know your negotiation skills comes into the picture you may say okay you owe your client owes my client fifty thousand dollars extra on top of you know anything else in equalization payment and then the other party may say you know no your client instead owes me my client and this is what the amount is and that's where you need to know how to review these net family property uh, statements to show or to you know, argue or negotiate. 
And what goes into these net family property uh, statements are these matrimonial homes, other properties, business values, because if there is an, uh, a business that the one person owns, then they have a percentage value to it. They could be 100% owners and they have a business value to it, and they need to put that value. There's a very common um, practice that family lawyers do because they're not able to gather all these information in one shot. So they always put like a TBD in certain places where you know um, they're still in the process of gathering the information. So they'll just say to be determined. And so you will just have to be uh, you know diligent enough to go after them to ask them these information so they are able to you know get it to you. Pension valuation. If uh, one person, uh, one party, uh, you know, has uh, collected pension or is, uh, you know, a municipal or a government employee, they're able to get a pension, you know, private pension. So then they're able to do, you have to ask for a family value of the pension. And you can request that uh, to, um, you know, the proper forms. And then when you submit it to them, they will do the calculation and then they will tell you exactly how much is the amount that you know this particular marriage um, that you can make a claim in, within this particular marriage and so for example if your client is a TPC employee they have a TPC pension because you know this is uh, a government uh, entity so therefore they will have a specific uh, pension that they have you know given on top of the regular pension that everybody you know uh, contributes so then that in that pension, your client can have a share. And so there, therefore, you will have to submit that pension valuation form to the TTC pension uh, department, and then they will do the calculation and they'll submit, they'll send it back to you. Obviously, both parties need to sign off on it, and then they will tell you the exact value of the pension, uh, family value of the pension. And you can make your 50% claim um, for your client from that pension value. Notional cost and deductions, I've just mentioned it here. Uh, you have to be careful because there are um, true lawyers who utilize notional cost for uh, deductions in net family property calculations. So for example, RR, RRSPs, you know, they can do a notional cost expense for RRSPs. They can do 20%, 30%, 10%, 50%, I don't know, whatever numbers that they think that they want to do because what they're saying is like, their client is planning to break the RRSP in the future, maybe in the next five years or five years or 10 years, and therefore they are going to incur a withdrawal expense. So even though the RRSP today in the net family property calculation shows that, look, it is uh, 50,000 worth of RRSP, he or she is stating through these notional costs that in, in all sense, I'm really not gonna get the entire $50,000 I need to deduct 20% because I need to pay that to the government back in taxes. And I'm, in reality, this is the only amount that I'm actually going to get. So they are uh, you know, deducting it in advance as notional costs. That is one type of notional cost. And there are many other few other uh, type of notional costs that parties can you know, bring in. So when we go into details of utilization payment, I can, of course, go into you know, samples of it, so then you can have a better idea as to how to draft these uh, net family properties and how to be cautious, how to read other parties' net family properties. So all these properties, except matrimonial property, of course, will be yeah. calculated as NFP, right? No, like even the, no, so matrimonial property is also a part of the net family property. Okay, so we also include that in the every, NFP every calculation. Property. There are exclusions, actually, I've, I haven't put it in here as one of the bullet points. There are exclusions to um, your properties as well. So if in case you came into the marriage with one property, right, you, you own this property, when your partner, you know, you married your partner and you came with that, you know, and that partner started living with you in that house. So your, that partner is only entitled to the valuation of that pro property from the date of marriage. So from the date of purchase up until the date of marriage, whatever the value was, you're supposed to be credited back that value. They are not entitled to make a claim for that value. So that, so is, it, that is something that you need to do. That The net family property calculation will do that for you. Okay, so the, the value in NFP will be calculated from the date of marriage when, when you actually happen to join that property uh, mm -hmm. with the spouse. 
right? So yes. your calculation begins from that day in the marriage, right? So yeah, there are three, po three points in NF, uh, net family property calculation. We do the marriage date, the separation date, and the current date. Okay, I'll tell you when all we use these. So the, re the reason why I use the marriage date is for anything that you brought into marriage, you need a credit for, right? Uh, there are many times that you, you bring in jewelry into the marriage. That is something that is excluded because you brought it in, you can take it back. Uh, you brought in a property, right? So you can take a, a certain value of that property back, a credit to yourself in that net family property calculation. So that's where you need the you know, date of marriage calculation. So on the date of marriage, how much did you have in your bank accounts? How much, how many properties did you have? And what was the property value on the date of marriage? Is what something you need to put it in there, okay? And then the second point is the date of separation. On the date of separation, the, the same house, how much was it worth, right? If the house was worth 500 when, it, when, you, when <coughs> you entered the marriage and today the property is worth um, uh, 1 million, of course, there's a $500,000 equity on the property. You're entitled to make a claim in that 500,000 and your spouse is entitled to make a claim of uh, beyond the 500 because your spouse is the one who purchased that property and they were living in that property three years prior to your entry and they purchased the property at $300,000. So they'll be getting an extra two hundred thousand dollar credit on top of the share of the five hundred thousand. So that's how we have. Uh, I mean, in theory, we have done the formula of calculating it this way: that it's valuation date minus the date of marriage. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Fine. Okay. So that's exactly what you do. And now, why do you why do you put in current uh, dates? The so matrimonial home. Technically, you're selling it today. You're not selling it on the date of separation, right? I mean, you separate it on a certain date, but the actual house was actually sold on a later date. The house could be sold maybe six months or one year down the road. And if the house is sold six months or one year down the road, then you have to provide uh, that value as well, right? So what we do is we then manually input uh, the actual sold value of the matrimonial home on the as a day of uh, valuation for the net family property calculation instead of you know um, the uh, expected or uh, anticipated value of the matrimonial home. So when you are calculating, you may be preparing this list net family property several times because there are amendments you know happening throughout the process. Okay, Anna. does it make sense? Okay, next is the process in court. Uh, I've just given a gist of what happens in court. So initially you start filing an application. Uh, you, did, you file the application with all the reliefs. Uh, now you do need to check mark whether you know, you're seeking it through divorce order, a divorce act, or whether you're seeking it through the family court. There are two separate sections in the filing of application. And that is again, something that I will go over it with you when I show you the form specifically. Then the other party will file the answer. The, uh, the other party has to file the answer within 30 days of receiving the application. And then the other party, uh, after they file the answer, you have an extra 10 days to reply to their answer. Okay? So that is, what, that is the first step of a completion of your pleadings. Once the pleadings are done, you can set down the matter to start off with a case conference. Case conference, settlement conference, trial management conference. All these three conferences are on a without prejudice basis. None of the information discussed in front of the judge in these conferences can be utilized or used against the other in trials. So usually what the normal procedure was when, the, when, you know, uh, when it was not COVID, we used to attend courts in person. And after these case conferences and settlement conferences, the judge would be, judge usually used to return our briefs, case conference briefs back to us they never used to keep that on record in the court proceedings, okay? Now they do keep it, but they keep it on, uh, on a without prejudice basis. You can still not use the case conference uh, or settlement conference discussions or trial management conference discussions in court, unless the trial management discussions are specifically for how to the trial will proceed. So uh, these three case conference, settlement and trial conferences, they are closed and they cannot be opened. Right. That's correct. Yes, they are closed courts. Yeah. Okay. I have a small and, question, Helen. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
these three stages we talked about filing the application, then the answer comes and the reply comes. Mm -hmm. Now, if in the reply, this mm -hmm. applicant is bringing in certain things which you want to write about, how do you deal with that? That's the reason why, so I'll tell you how exactly you're, what you're doing. In an application, you're filing your claim, right? And then the other, yes. part, the other person has filed an answer Yes. But in that answer, they have an option in that answer form to file a claim against you. Yes. The reason why you're filing a reply is to reply to their claim. So if you have replied to somebody's claim, they should not have another opportunity to reply to your reply. Do you see, okay. the, do you see the logic behind it now? Yeah. Yeah, that's the reason why there's only three steps. Application, answer, and a reply. In the answer, the, the person who's answering has two, two steps. One, they have to reply to the application, and, and in the second step, they're making all the claims that they want to make against you. And that's the reason why you should have an opportunity to reply to their claim, and that's what you're replying to. You're not really replying to their reply, specifically. Okay? Yeah. I'll talk to you in person later. About <laughs> okay. that, that answer, sorry, that reply has to be within 10 days of receiving the answer, right? That's yes, it. yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so next is motions. Of course, when is the right time to bring in motion? What is an urgent motion? Forms and affidavits? And what are it, what are the expectations of court from you and evidence to you? This is a whole, whole, whole new thing. And uh, I'll tell you what the Brampton Court has now done. Brampton Court is so frustrated with lawyers bringing in motions in court that the Brampton Court has reduced motions to one motion per court uh, uh, application. They're so frustrated because they're so far behind in hearings that they cannot entertain any further motions. Unless it's a very urgent motion, it's going to be very difficult if you bring in one motion and, you know, uh, and if you're, you know, if you have not utilized it the right way. Basically, that's what it is. And remember that, when is the right time to bring in a motion is very, very, very important because if you bring in a motion and if you lose it, you are paying for cost for the other side. And these costs are very expensive costs. So you, your client will be the one you know, responsible to make these costs. And obviously this could you know, even um, scar your relationship with your client. So it is very, very important for you to make sure when you're bringing in a motion that your client understands why there is a need for bringing the motion and what are the chances of you winning the motion and what are the chances of you losing the motion. So the client is very well aware of prior to you proceeding with any motion in court. What is an urgent motion? An urgent motion could be something, for example, you know, you need to immediately sell the house or your spouse has run away with your child to another country. You need to bring in a hate convention related uh, you know, motion in court to uh, bring your child back, or you may want to bring in an urgent motion because you know your child is being abducted and uh, they are in the process of leaving the country. So you may want to get like an immediate order from the court. Um, recently, just very recently, last week, I had to do something where we were in the post process of a motion to change of a separation agreement because the spouse refused to um, amend the separation agreement. So I had to file a motion to change. And we went through the initial case conference sometimes in June, but he was not here when we were going through the case conference. And the opposing uh, counsel was saying that, you know, he's willing to do the amendment, blah, blah, blah. We went through an entire full day case conference. The, the, DRO, which is the dispute resolution officer. In New Market Courts, the first case conference is done through the dispute resolution officer instead of a judge. So the dispute resolution officer was sitting there listening to everything up until the end of the day, which is like we were here in the office till 10 o'clock at night trying to resolve, could not resolve. Then guess what? I come to know that he had already fled the country. He has you know, gotten rid of all his assets. The only asset that was remaining was his matrimony, that was his house, and we were able to save uh, the house at the very last minute. And we put, uh, you know, that how uh, you know got a court order just last week. An urgent motion was done. The judge gave us a court order to go and register, 
you know, um, on the title of the property that, you know, this particular house is subject to a court order and any proceeds of the sale cannot be dispersed to the party until and unless, you know, the judge gives further orders as to how this money should be distributed. So there are many things that you need to know and you need to be well versed about the law, about the case, about how to proceed, when to proceed. You know, uh, clients are very, um, you know, agitated at all the time. They always want to go for motions. They may always say like, why aren't you doing something about it? Why aren't you taking it to court? Why can't we do this right now? Why can't we do this? Why are you taking, you know, this route? Why can't we take this route? You know, they just want immediate action. So sometimes you have to use logical, you know, thinking. You need to know whether this is going to, you know, affect your client financially. And you have to, at that point, educate your client with all the facts of the case and the possibilities of what the judge's rulings are going to be. So then they are well, uh, you know, um, soundly advised prior to you proceeding with motion. A, a, an urgent motion situation, it's very clear most of the times whether you're going to get that motion heard and whether the judge is going to definitely give you a court order or not. So, for example, in my case, I had proof that the house was sold. And I provided a copy of the MLS listing to the court and the judge was satisfied enough that, you know, yeah, obviously, that why would be why would he sell the house and not be in the city, the country otherwise? So um, that is something that we will need, uh, I guess, one full day to discuss motions, uh, all the various type of motions. Through my experiences, I will also show how to draft motion materials so they are effective. How to draft motion, uh, uh, you know, how to draft the actual motion um, reliefs. That is also something that you may want to be careful about. How to draft cost uh, uh, submissions. Uh, that is also something that you may need to know because obviously, when you are filing your motion materials, the judge wants you to submit your cost submissions as well. And that makes you look like, you know, uh, a lawyer who has done every, all the homework from all sides. When you have your cost submissions, the judges are willing to listen to costs right away and award you the cost if you have won that particular motion right away. Okay, uh, settlement. So when uh, the matter is uh, reaching a uh, trial management conference and you're almost, you think that you've narrowed down most of the issues, you were able to enter some orders uh, and it's only one or two issues that are, you know, still outstanding then it is best at that point to send offers to settle. And these are formal offers to settle. And these formal offers to settle can be used against each other in court at a trial when they are submitting cost submissions in trial. So if one party wins a uh, certain thing, a uh, certain issue, and the other party loses the same issue, and you have offered the same what the judge has actually ordered, or you were somewhere close to what the judge has ordered, then the chances of you uh, getting the cost for that particular um, issue in trial is much higher if you had served an offer to settle. So that is the reason why it is a very good practice to proceed with offers to settle when you're 100% guaranteed or when you are fully uh, you know, aware that you know, your offer to settle is very fair and you think that the judge also, if the judge had given an order, would have also given the same order, okay? Uh, negotiations, uh, I mean, nobody wants to really go to trial. The, the judges, if you, if you go for these conferences, case conference, settlement conference, even trial management conference, you'll see what the judge says. The judge is mostly saying, settle among each other. The only person who's actually earning is the lawyer. So the judge will always continuously try to encourage the clients to negotiate and settle. And uh, trust me, as a family lawyer also, if you are able to negotiate and settle things on a timely matter for your client, you know, your client will recommend you more clients, you know, and you will actually have more fun practicing family law because you're not sitting with one file for, you know, several years, you know, and then you lose an interest in that file too because you're not able to see beyond the certain issues. So it is better to deal with uh, every file on a timely manner for you to get the timely results because there are some times if you don't act upon certain things it is no longer valid after a certain time okay after all these things are done is when you set a matter down for divorce so if you are able to negotiate you're able to draft something called a minutes of settlement and you're able to get the judge to uh, issue and enter that minutes of settlement and if you settle all the issues in the minutes of settlement you can ask the judge 
to set the matter down for the world. So what it basically means is like all the corollary reliefs are being settled now and the judge can order us to proceed with divorce. Another thing we do is called severing of divorce. So during the process of this whole uh, matrimonial litigation, maybe one party wants to get married, right? It's been more than two years of separation and the, uh, that party wants to get married, even though the corollary reliefs have not been you know, settled. So then they may uh, bring in a motion to sever the divorce. Or they may ask the other party whether they, whether they consent to sever the divorce from all the other corollary issues. You just have to satisfy the judge at that point that the issues related to children are at least on a temporary basis, you know, uh, settled. So in that case, then the, then the judge will be willing to sever the divorce for you. So this is basically, uh, you know, a gist of what uh, you uh, do in a family uh, law um, well, a case specifically. Obviously, you will be, um, you know, surprised because you will be having to do many studies. Sometimes you have to do study what is a business valuation report, or sometimes you may have to study an appraisal report of a property which you may not have experience about, or you may have to know how to um, put an application for matrimonial designation on a on on a title of a property because your party or your client is not on the panel of the property. So they want to make sure that, you know, there is a caution and there is, uh, uh, you know, something registered on the title, you know, to, you know, kind of notify everybody that this particular property is subject to uh, matrimonial uh, litigation or process and that cannot be uh, sold without your client's consent. So these are other things that you may also want to have some knowledge of. So it's not just the family law that you want to have knowledge of. You want to know some things about tort law. You want to know some things about uh, real estate. You, you want to know some things about business and corporations. Because if you, if your client's spouse, uh, you know, mostly deals with corporations, and you may want to know some amount of corporate law to, to you know, identify, you know, the discrepancies in the documentation that they send to you. So overall, I believe I kind of captured everything, uh, what I'm going to be covering. Uh, definitely, if you want me to specify, uh, you know, want me to specifically, you know, delve onto a certain topic that is not discussed here, uh, you can definitely, you know, send me an email and ask me about it. I can uh, put it on the Skype, uh, in the Skype uh, what it, group my email address and you're uh, you know, more than free to you know, send me emails to ask me anything you, know, you wanna ask me about. I will put my phone number and also my email address so, so you can contact me uh, at any point. But what to expect in the next uh, class is um, we're going to talk in detail about the initial meeting, retainers, how to write, what to write, and hopefully also go through the separation uh, agreement process or at least some domestic agreements. Uh, I believe uh, I've captured quite a lot in today's uh, uh, um, class. Well, I'm we... hoping that I was of, of some help to everybody <laughs> to a great extent at least. No, definitely, will we actually have the forms or how will we follow what you're saying? Yes, yes, of course. I will be uh, uh, presenting the forms. And if you, uh, during, uh, what I can also do is um, maybe post those forms somewhere so then that way you all can have access to those forms even after, right? If you if you want to have access to those forms, uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the samples. Right, and also before so that we can go over oh, them yes. with you. Yes, yes. I can definitely uh, uh, send it to you. So what you can do is probably send me an email or something like that, and then I can forward that to everybody. Uh, I can see that there are 17 participants here. So I can definitely, if I have everyone's email address or something, I can forward it to you. Or I can uh, speak with Mr. Chaudhary and see how I can get my materials across to you all, and then I can get that. Will that suffice? You can put your email here in the chat, Helen. Yeah, I will, I will. 
I'm just gonna about, I'm just about to put it. I'm not giving you my work email address because that it's going to get bombarded otherwise. So this is my other email address where, which I'm going to be specifically, you know, answering all your questions. So you can send it to me, uh, you know, to this email address, any specific questions. And I will reach out to Mr. Chaudhary how to get my materials across to you. And then I will send that out to you so you can, you know, uh, prepare in advance of our next uh, session. Okay. So I, if every, if uh, I can receive confirmation from everybody, then I could probably end today's meeting. I hope it was of uh, good use in today's uh, session. And if you want me to change the way I'm show, uh, explaining things, please, please, please do tell me. I do like to be feedback. So I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much for a great class. Okay, I'm, I'm glad. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So I'm it was really see... a wonderful class, Helen. Thank you so okay. much. Yes, okay. very informative and look forward to the further sessions. Thank you, Helen. No problem, no problem, I'm glad. And as I said, if you need any specific questions, please do email me, all right? So I hope you all have a wonderful day ahead. I know today's was a little very tedious and boring and I will try to keep it entertaining in the next sessions. <laughs> okay. Oh when is when is the next class supposed to be? I'm I believe it's going to be weekly. I'll have to confirm it with Mr. Chaudhary. He will definitely uh, notify everybody in due course. Hello? Sounds good Helen. Thank yes, you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. You have everyone have a good day. You too. Bye. Bye.